surfing, skateboarding, mountain biking, and more with a California icon, a Santa Cruz legend, and one of the true entrepreneurial pirates in our world, Rich Novak. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. This is Christopher Lockhead, and thank you so much for joining us for this most outstanding episode of Legends and Losers. Uh, by the way, if you could hear a little little bit of whining, that's um, that's beautiful baby Beatrice. Bibi, can you say something? Hi, B. <laughs> if you're new to Legends and Losers, uh, you may not realize uh, my wife and I are the proud uh, caretakers of a flock of six beautiful hens. And from time to time, they join us here on uh, Legends and Losers. And so for uh, this intro outro, uh, the beautiful baby Beatrice is with us. <laughs> And if you're new, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, so on Legends and Losers, we aspire to have uh, conversations, dialogues about what it really takes to lead a legendary life and to design a legendary business. And we try to do it in, in, in as an, bleh, authentic way as possible. And uh, you know, sometimes we have conversations with uh, dinosaurs, AKA backyard chickens, and we chase a zebra down rabbit holes. But most importantly, I don't know about you, um, there she is, and maybe you heard that one. Um, I, I really do believe one conversation can change your life. And when I think about my life, and I'm sure when you think about your life, there are some conversations that we've had at various points along the way that sort of stop us dead in our tracks, cause us to reflect, open us up to some new ideas, uh, and, and maybe shine a, a light or, or, or a path. And, um, and it's really, um, to use a, an overphrase word, somewhat transformative. And so the question um, that Legends and Losers asks is, can we have conversations that matter? You know, can we catch lightning in a bottle? And in order to do that, we're a new format of show. See, most, most shows that you've ever heard or even, even articles that you've read are in an interview paradigm. You have a, a, a professional journalist with a list of questions and a narrative they're trying to prosecute. And then you have a guest uh, who's got their media trained talking points. And so when you and I hear the average business show, or frankly, read the average uh, business publication, what we're really experiencing is an interviewer with a prepared narrative colliding with the interviewee with talking points. And it can be somewhat inauthentic. And it, it I don't know about you, but it just, it's bullshit. And so the question that we try to answer is, can you capture conversations uh, that are fun, that are insightful, that are motivating, that are inspiring <laughs> about how to design a legendary life and a legendary business. And today we have that. Our guest, Rich Novak, is a true entrepreneurial uh, pirate. And without him, the surf industry, the skateboard industry, and the mountain biking industry uh, might not exist. And they certainly wouldn't exist the way they do because in all of those cases and more, uh, Richard Novak, the co-founder of NHS in Santa Cruz, who is a California icon, a, a surf and skate icon, um, was an entrepreneur, is an entrepreneur who pioneered all of those things and is a natural, intuitive uh, designer of companies, products, brands, and of course, categories. So we're going to get into it in an amazing way with Rich. Now, um, before we get started, I do need to do a, a quick shout out. Uh, a longtime friend of the show, pretty much from the beginning, Casey McCoy, was kind enough to send me this beautiful uh, decanter. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. It's, it's, it's heavy, and it, it's a great shape, and it's got the Legends and Losers logo on it. And he sent that to us for our first year birthday. Uh, and so, Casey, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this beautiful decanter. You didn't have to do that, but it's wonderful. And I also want to uh, re-shout out to my old, uh, oh, I shouldn't say old, my dear uh, longtime friend, <laughs> Ramsey Smith from Australia. He sent this wonderful Sullivan's Cove, which we've been knocking over. And I am now going to pour this Sullivan's Cove whiskey from Australia, all the way from Australia, into this beautiful decanter um, that uh, Casey sent. And uh, this will be the official decanter of Legends and Losers. And uh, this Sullivan's Cove, uh, we're going to polish this off pretty quickly around here. And there it is, ta-da, the great, the great pouring, the full or almost full decanter. 
because uh, we have been getting into it. So thank you, Casey. Thank you again, Ramsey, and bless you. All right, Rich Novak is a California icon and Santa Cruz legend. He's the co-founder of the privately held company NHS Inc. He started this company uh, with Doug Hout, the legendary surfboard shaper. And uh, Doug is one of the two surfboard shapers who changed my life. I have some custom Doug boards that I ride all the time. And uh, Doug Hout is a, is a treasure in sort of the surf world and here in Santa Cruz. So um, uh, Rich started the company with Doug and a guy named Jay Shurman back in 1973. And uh, ever since that time, he has played a, ma a major role in the creation and category design of the surf industry as we know it. Uh, the skateboard industry, he took skateboarding to the masses. He's more responsible for the popularity of skateboarding than I would say even Tony Hawk is. Um, his Santa Cruz uh, skateboard company is the oldest continuously operating skateboard company in the world. He's the uh, co-creator of the beloved skater magazine Thrasher. And interestingly enough, he is an early pioneer in mountain biking as the co-founder of Santa Cruz Mountain Bikes. And his company NHS has created See, Beatrice is getting excited for Rich already. <laughs> His company, NHS, has created some of the most iconic brands you can think of uh, in, in the California skate surf world. Uh, brands like Creature, Independent Truck Company, NorCal, uh, one of my personal favorites, Slime Balls. And he actually owns the word Santa Cruz. Uh, he has the trademark for Santa Cruz, and you'll hear <laughs> a little bit on the show. Here he is, a true original, a surf skate pirate, an icon of California, a legend of Santa Cruz, Rich Novak on Legends and Losers. <laughs> well, I always made surfboards. I started, so the whole time, you're, of course, you're surfing, but you're also making boards. Yeah, I started making boards for a company called Macau Surfboards. It was on the corner of River and Water Street. And, and did you know Doug at this point? Doug wasn't in Santa Cruz then. Okay. He was in Wisconsin. Okay. He came from, and the, then he was raised, I think, in Fremont. And so I started learning how to use the resins and stuff from these guys. Mike Winterburn was shaping and George Olson was shaping. And then we were all kind of, because we, we learned how to make boards with balsa wood. So I learned how to glue up, ball, pick your balsa first. You know, I think it was uh, LA veneers or something. You go down and you pick balsa all day. So you make, you get a blank. So you get five pieces of balsa, then you, band them together, then you go get another five pieces. And what you were trying to do was to get, if I remember this right, is uh, three male and two females. And you put the female on the rail, and then you try to get the ones with the warp for, for rocker because it was wow. only like four or so inches thick. So you get all this together. You spend a whole day doing that. You throw just, it in your Just car. picking the right just pieces picking the wood. and put it, trying to put this puzzle in your head together yeah. in Each reality. Each board was a puzzle. And this wow. is how I was taught to do it. And then you come back up north and then you start you glue normally just like you would with uh would uh glue glue it with a wood what do they call those damn things like a, just a wood, powerful wood adhesive i don't know well, what, you use well wood glue and then you have uh, the clamps that you clamp wood clamps so you clamp it all together and then you squeeze you first you, well then you first before that you didn't have planer so you had to plane your edges your glue joints down so they you had 100 percent contact wow so you take your rises out so you'd use what they call the japanese planer which is about three feet long to and give did it, it have to be precise to work not really no okay no, it was all everything was in a certain range you know? as long as it was nice and tight and you had so much glue up. on the wood that you know it would you, know, you overdid the glue part of it okay and then you'd um you know you'd cut, uh, glue your blank up and then you'd take uh, a straight edge, a long straight knife like this, and two handles on it. Then you draw back, so you wouldn't blow the grain on it. And then you carve, you'd hog your board down, and then you throw a template on it. Then you cut it out with just a regular saw, and then you go back to the plane systems until you got it down to the bottom. And so then you have a balsa wood board. And and how long did it take you to get to this spot? In a couple the... days, two three days. Okay. There's not a, not, you know, there's no power planers or anything. Yeah. <laughs> there's no rocker lines or rocker bars or stuff. So we were all just learning, you know, it was just like, now you have to glass it, you know? So how do you, you know, okay, it's a balsa board if it leaks. So we use two tens with a 10 deck patch and just polyester resin, you know? So that's a lot of weight on the board. So the board comes out around 42 pounds. So you laminate it. And then eventually you say, oh, if I laminate the bottom and I tape, 
the wood, then I can cut a good line around it. Uh, and there was a guy named George Doolittle. He was a wood shop teacher in Palo Alto, and he was way ahead of the curve on it. He had it wired, so we learned a lot from him. Uh, and you learn how to glass, and that that lasted till probably '58 or so, and then just started making my own boards and just knocking around. And then Jack opened up his shop, O'Neill, around 1960. He started, and we started working in his factory. And then. In 1961, I told Jack, I said, you know, I'd just rather be your friend. You're just really hard to work for. So we've been friends. Yeah. We were, he's a really good friend. He's a really close guy. He always treated me right. But I think that one of the deals was is I didn't work for him. Yeah, and you knew that and you were wise enough. At yeah, that I like even. Jack. and I, He was a, one of the best self-promoters I've ever met. And he, you know, he, I learned a lot from him. I mean, he would Things like, hey, you want to go see a surf movie? Sure, we're going to go to we're going to go over to San Jose. We're going to put a surf movie on. Why don't you come over? You can watch the movie. Well, what it meant was that you'd have to work the goddamn movie for him, and so he'd give you a ticket, which you couldn't sit down because it was sold out. Right? That was <laughs> that's how he, you know, or <laughs> that's how you became a volunteer that night. Oh, I always he pulled a hundred of those things on us. Oh, that's so great. You know, oh, you want to, I, I got you signed up to give sailing lessons. Well, I don't really know how to sail. That's okay. You'll learn when you're giving the lessons, you know, so you take some poor people out, and torture them and you get them back alive. And then you go, oh, shit. Yeah. I made it. One of the things he didn't, he always tried to get me to do that I wouldn't do was get up in that stupid balloon with him. Because I told that him. That balloon looked like a, a suicide mission. Oh, it it, he never landed. It looked like some crazy, you know, gizmo from the twenties or something. Yeah, and he had like a chair, like a Bozeman chair. Well, in what it. was it? It was like it, it was, was a balloon, just like, air balloon. Yeah, just like they have now when you go. But why did it look so nutty? Because that was Jack. He always he just, wanted to cut corners. So I think Tim, his son, had to build a Boston Whaler with a landing ramp on it so he could chase him around the ocean when he landed and catch him. Oh but God. I never did that, and I, to the day he died, I said, Jack, I never got your balloon with you can't pull that one on me. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Not that's doing just that. too, that's where my crazy line is. <laughs> yeah. So George Olson was kind of the father of the ultralight sailboats and he was also a surfboard shaper. So he had a surf shop. He had a surfboard company on 7th Avenue where Harbor Cafe is. At first it was on 7th and Soquel where Cardiff Pest Control was. Then he moved it to the Yacht Harbor and he said, well, you can be my partner, but you got to flunk the draft first because I don't want to have you as a partner than have you drafted you know so i successfully j flunked the draft and uh, <laughs> went into my first business Do you at tell 19. Me how or? <laughs> i was physically and mentally unfit for military service oh uh, okay physically i looked like an adonis compared to the guys on the line yeah mentally, I mean, you, you spent your whole life surfing yeah, right six one 215 pounds with a 31 inch waist and tan and i'm looking at some v, right? weasel in front of me is like 115 pounds with you know, 10 pounds of pubic hair on them. <laughs> <laughs> I win every time, you know. Yeah, uh, then the psychiatrist, they put me on a psych deal and the guy asked me, uh, do you have a problem killing people? And I said, nah, I don't have a problem. But I said, I'll tell you what. I said, if you draft me and for $285 a month, I said, I'll kill you for free. <laughs> and the guy kicked me out of the army. He's, they wouldn't <laughs> even give me a bus ride home. They kicked me to the sidewalk. Wow. So that ended that career. So, so it pays to be crazy. I just, you know, this was pre, I'm a pre baby boomer. And yeah. so the stuff we did was unheard of because of the, all the patriotism from world war two and going back to these mentors of mine that were world war two guys, they all ended up in um, Korea and they found out that that was a political war with no, no, in, no into it. You know, it was just political. So when they came back, they drilled in our heads, like, don't fucking waste your time with this shit. This is just a political war. Why sacrifice your life for some politician or some armaments manufacturer? And these are very gung-ho patriotic guys. I mean, these are the guys that hit every Pacific Island in the Pacific. You know, I mean, the stories they tell are just, you, you don't read them in history books. 80% casualty rates in their units. You know. Fuck. Uh, shrapnel wounds that you went through that you know stuff is unheard of crap and so them for them to turn you after the big. korean war and you're very young and at that time the information was just starting to come in hot and heavy because you were dealing with 
an element like the beatnik element and it was the hippies hadn't even shown up yet you know so you're dealing with these guys and they got you reading this stuff and they're questioning authority and they're on the beach because they don't like authority you know there's no the way it was put to me is you go to the beach and there's no parents teachers or cops and so they leave you alone so you can do what you want you know now with surfing it's like little league you got parents and moms and all this other shit, you know, it's a subjective sport. You don't need that shit. Yeah. Uh, but Santa Cruz, I mean, you tell me, uh, still feels like it's got very much of a tough, uh, I don't know if you'd call it an it's underbelly. Territory. It's really or, territorial. Um, I mean, you, you can get into a fight in this town. I can get in a fight anywhere. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. But I mean, this town is, there's a gruffness to it. Well, it's Northern California, and there's always been a battle between Northern and Southern California. So in the late 50s, it was, I mean, I used to look for people to go surf outside pleasure because there was nobody, I'd go out by myself, or two of us would go out, three of us, there, nobody here all year long. Surfing Pleasure Point. Yeah, anywhere. The Hook was a secret spot. In, in what year? It was like all the way up till around 61 or 62. Wow. I'd, you just had all that incredible oh, surf to yourself. I, I was raised in Capitola. So yeah. around after the early 50s, I would paddle from Capitola up to 38th Avenue. And my friend lived on 38th Avenue. And so the kid I went to school with. And so I'd park my board on the beach and then I'd walk up 38th. And I'd, that's when they had milk deliveries. And I used to go and drink the cream off the top of the milk and put the top back on until my friend's mother told me, you can't do that. <laughs> to have a snack. <laughs> well, you, you're, you know, it's a long paddle. Yeah, of course. You get, a little, cold get and, a little juice. Yeah, so we used to, and you're in a sweater still. This is pre-wetsuit. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is pre-anything. I was just doing it. And it, again, you're on top of the water. You're not in the water. Yeah. You know, you're very, you're, your toes and knees are the only thing that gets wet. You know, so you're, and I had started with kook boxes, which are hollow plywood boards. So they were 10 feet long. So you could, uh, there's a picture somebody said of me in the Soquel Creek in 1949 with a kook box and a canoe paddle paddling down to the, in, you know, the mouth of the river to go up the coast. So maybe we're the first stand up guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe you invented this up. Yeah. So anyway, Olson had this surf company and I got into business with him and I was, I was a lot better at business than he was. He was this was really, after you decided you were not going to play with Jack together. Oh, this is yeah. This was a couple of years after that. Yeah, I just worked uh, pickup jobs on working for surfboards or whatever right. I could do. You know, garbage man, fisherman, uh, worked the canneries, but you know, always kept my fingers with resin on them. And so Olson and I started this business, Olson Surfboards. And uh, and what year would that have been? Rich? Sixty-one, I think. Yeah. You know, so Olson was, he was an unbelievable craftsman. I mean, he's just, he's a genius, but he had zero business skills. And I had the business skills. I was a good, I was an okay craftsman. And uh, so we started this surf shop and we were doing like seven, eight, I think we did 14 boards a week sometimes, which is pretty hard to do. And just two guys. Just two of us. Well, we bring guys up from For Southern help, California. Or glass you know. or guys or yeah, glass and guys. We poached a lot of guys out of South Bay to, to glass. But two full-time guys. Just George and I and let's see who else was in that shop then. Well, in the 61, it was really slow. And then as surfing, the baby boomers started coming into it around then. So we got this whole population increase. And then they were doing all the Gidget movies down South. So that brought in a lot of surfers. And so you had to... And there was nobody making surfboards then. So you brought in these guys. And then, let's see. So then George, then, then Doug, Doug had taken off to Hawaii and he ended up, I think, with uh, Mike Diffenderfer. And then he, he, Mike taught him signed the basics of shaping and then he went to Florida and hog foam. Then he came back and he went to work for us, I think in 62. And I was shaping then, and I, he was way better shaper than me. So I just quit doing that and let him do it. He was really good. So, so how, how does one, I mean, at that point, you've been making surfboards for a long time, right? And yeah. you, you've been, I mean, this is a craft for you, and it's now turned into a business. But you see Doug, and you immediately go, no, you, not me. Well, we, I met Doug in, at Outside Pleasure. I was driving by, and he was sitting on the curb. And we we're trying to figure, I trying to figure out, 
who the guy was. I mean, this is our territory. You know, is this guy from the valley or what? You know, so I went up and started talking to him. Doug's a really cool guy. He's a nice guy. Like, wow, this guy's pretty cool. You know, so we actually became we came became friends, and, and uh, he worked at O'Neill's with me. And he he was in the back room, you know, doing stringers and stuff. I mean, it was a whole menage of stuff to do. You you got to kind of go. You kind of shift all the way backwards to around 1957 or so when Grubby Clark and and uh, Hobie Alter started inventing the phone. And I met Grubby around that time, and I had an aptitude for math, and he was t trying to teach me physics. Um, but it's also he it was he brought foam into the surf world, which changed the whole surfboard from balsa to foam. I mean, it's like that overnight. So now you can mass produce products who didn't have to hand pick your blanks. And, and the weight is materially different. Weight is right? half the weight. So you go from a 42 pound board to a 20 pound board and that's like a huge improvement. And were you guys uh, the first to do really mass production boards like no, that? There was guys down South that were cranking. They were doing it already. We're, Santa Cruz was, we, we wouldn't, we, the group I hung around with, if somebody came up with a camera, we'd throw them off the cliff. That's why you don't see a lot of photos of Santa Cruz. And, and at the same time, you see all, all So these, I bet you're a big fan of the Surfline cams. Oh, yeah, it's just yeah. a joke. Um, but down south, because, you know, it started out with uh, Bud Brown and uh, Warren Miller. They started making surf movies. Well, they didn't have to go anywhere to get surf. They had all those guys down there. So that's why you see all these famous old surfers now because they all came from Southern California. You don't see a lot of pictures of and Santa you, Cruz. You were throwing guys off the Well, you just like, don't take pictures, pictures because we don't want you up here. You know, we don't want your mass that was happening in Southern California to come to Santa Cruz. And we just don't want it because it's, it's going to create this crowd. But in hindsight, you couldn't stop it. Right. Because of the baby boomers, you know, 64 million kids from 1946 to 1974, 84 or something. Massive amount of people. So we didn't know that then. We just knew that this was our territory. Uh, you know, we'd surf it by the seasons. You'd surf, you know, Pleasure Point to Steamer Lane by the seasons. And then, and it wasn't really, the territory was Santa Cruz. You know, it wasn't Pleasure Point or, or West Steamer thing, right? Lane or Stupid. Stockton Avenue or... You know, you don't have guys camping out at one spot all year round. It was, you you know, waves would be better in the winter at Steamer Lane, so you go surf Steamer Lane. Days would be better at, in the summertime at Leisure Point. And before the harbor, the river mouth was probably the premier wave of the world. And that kind of lasted sometimes all the way into summer or through summer. Wow, it was that good. Oh, it was an unbelievable wave. It was probably the best wave I've ever surfed. And it got that fucked up. Oh, yeah. Well, there was no sand to the cliff then. So as the river went out, the sandbar went with it to the point. So it just was this pointed sandbar that went way out about 100, 100 to 150 yards off the point, sometimes more. So you could take off, you and I could take off shoulder to shoulder and you could go left and I could go right and it would just peel. Wow. Just all the way to the cliff. Wow. So you, and, and it's just insane. It wasn't a, super powerful wave it but was just a fun wave fun long yeah. ride just those long waves are insane right yeah because yeah. there's just not that many well there's not that many places that you can surf long rides you know and, and i mean there's a few places in mexico and south america and you get there's a couple long waves in peru but more or less it's really hard and then you have to have the right time whereas the river mouth could take a north swell or it could take a south swell or it could take a west swell. Oh, wow. So because it was just coming off Catching that point. Everything. Yeah. And the for some reason, the sandbar stayed a longer time. Hmm. You know, I can remember it going all the way into August and September, which now it's over, you know, right after the storm. But, you know, then Doc Scott started doing contests in the middle 60s and that kind of screwed everything up. These hmm. fucking idiots come all over the place, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But he stayed at Steamer Lane because every time he'd get out of Steamer Lane, we'd puncture his tires. <laughs> he had a school bus. And the Moss Landing guys were worse than we were. They didn't want him down there at all. He's a good man. He's just... You could still stuff. get your windows break broken today for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, like Hawaii, you go anywhere, you just leave your oh, doors open. Here four miles, yeah. three miles. Yeah, you just leave your car open. Yeah. Those are mostly just car clots. They're not... I mean, I went to surf Anio... You know, a few years ago and I hadn't surfed in a long time. We used to know the guy that owned the ranch at Anya. So we used to just drive right out to the point, but we knew 
that in the summertime, with the prevailing northwest wind, that every afternoon we'd get an offshore wind with a wind swell, and it would bounce off the point and it's just a, you know, straight line down to the river mouth. <coughs> and so I went up there a few years ago, five or six years ago, my old longboard, and there's this locals, you know, from San Mateo. Like, fuck, you're not a local if you're from San Mateo. You're from San Mateo. <laughs> you're a valley kook. And so they're always, they're, they're giving you the eye. And so they, they see you go out. So they go and jump on the, on the wave and they fuck the wave up because they're, they're just not. They're doing this with you. Yeah. They don't know who I am. They don't, I mean, I'm just there. So I go out and I start taking off on the left-hand side of the peak and just shooting a line down, you know. So they had to come out and show me that they were cool too. So it just got to be this like, what do I care? Why do I care about you guys? You know, you're just, I'm out here surfing this wave. I've been surfing it since the fifties and you obviously don't know the wave. I don't know how long you've spent here, but you don't know where to go. You don't know where to take off. And, and it's kind of all, all over like that now, you know, this last swell I was watching at privates and there's a 50 people out and two guys are surfing the waves in the right spot. The rest of them are just charging on closeouts you know, and, and I mean, I thought, that's not surfing. That's not fun. Yeah. I don't get that charging on closeouts thing, yeah. but yeah. nobody knows how to read the waves. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I like to surf. So when did the, when did you sort of realize like, Hey, wait a minute, we might actually have a real business here making surfboards. No, skateboards, never surfboards. It was never surfboards. No surfboards was the way that grubby set it up because he controlled the blanks. So by controlling the foam, and I'm actually really good friends with Grubby. I still, we still are friends. Um, the way he set it up is that you, if you were making a hundred boards a week, your blank costs would be maybe two or $3 below anybody off the street could buy a board or a blank. And that was the, that was the thing you needed to make a board. So it opened up every town to a garage shaper. You know, so Ooh. every garage shaper, first thing they do is they undercut the pricing so they can sell their boards. And so like right now it costs, say if you make a six foot board, it costs you about three twenty five to make it maybe three fifty if you're paying taxes and stuff. And these guys are selling boards for 400 bucks. So there's a 50 cent, $50 margin in that product. And you, you know, as well as I do, you can't. So then that helps explain it in, in a level of detail. I never quite understood that way. Because here's what blows me away. Um, you know, I learned to surf later in life. So I started uh, at around 40. And I had a lot of success and a lot of failure. More failure than anything physically I've ever attempted. And I kept quitting. But, you know, it sort of had me by the balls. And so I decided I needed, you know, I'd gotten down to a seven, six and I was trying to be cool and, you know, be like Kelly Slater and all that and get a smaller, smaller board. And so I sort of had this meltdown. I said, fuck it. Anyway, long story longer, Doug Hout changed my life because he built me a 10, two board that moves, yeah. you know, cause I like a big board. I want help catching the wave, but I, I, I don't just want to stand there on it. I want to be able to do stuff. And he knows how to build a big board that moves. Yeah. And as I, you know, if, if I show you my how boards, I look at them and I go, if this was a, if this was a master carpenter who created like an incredible table for you that was, had the same level of knowledge and craftsmanship that went into one of Doug's handmade boards. I don't know. You tell me, would it be a $10,000 table? Oh yeah. Well, just it'd be a, it would be a lot more than the thousand bucks or the twelve hundred bucks I paid for it. Yeah, which so I just go. It was twelve hundred bucks to get Doug Hout, who's a living legend, master to create this board. It seems in, insane to me. Yeah. Well, this you'll go down to the store and buy a set of tires for six hundred dollars, and you won't think anything of it. You'll just take out your credit card. What's it cost them? Fifty bucks to make those tires? You don't question it. Right. Sometimes I go in the water and I listen to guys talking and tell, they're telling me what a, you know, telling each other what a great deal they got on a surfboard. I pay, I got this 10 foot board from arrow for $400, you know, and I get really pissed off for exactly that reason, because I know what it takes to make a surfboard. And it's like, you guys want to be surfers, but yet you don't want to support the artists or the craftsmen in the surfing industry. Well, yeah. 
And, yeah. and the thing, you know, I'm a skier and interesting to me how different the personal relationship you have with your surfboard is than you have with your skis. I mean, I'm picky about my skis. I want to, you know, ski a certain kind of ski, but the reality is if I wanted to go to Europe and maybe I didn't want to drag my gear, um, I, I could rent a great pair of skis and have a great day. It's at least for me, maybe it's different for some other servers. It's not quite that way on somebody else's board. Doug has made boards exactly for me and I, I'm attached to those boards. It's not that I can't surf other boards, but it's, uh, there's going to be an asterisk on the session because <laughs> I wasn't on my board. That's, and that's all to do with, you know, I surf all over the world, and a lot of times I borrow boards. Sure. Sometimes I have good days, and sometimes I have bad days. So I was in Baja with Doyle, Mike Doyle, and he says, I got this garage full of boards. Take what you want, you know. And Mike and I go back to the 50s, and I go, so I go in and I pick, the best board which was his and so i go in the water and i'm getting shit from guys for surfing mike's board what do you got his board for us because i took it that's why i got it <laughs> but i had a really good session because mike's boards are really good his personal boards are they work you know then you go to uh, to england and you're surfing in wales and you got some fucking log that's made by joe jack off in you know <laughs> bristol or someplace and it's it's just a big piece of something with fiberglass on it and you have a really shitty day, you know? Yeah. So I, I, in 1999, I crushed my leg racing go-karts in, in Switzerland and I had to go from a six, four board to a 10 foot board. And I, when I got on the 10 foot board and I started surfing, I went, wow, I really miss how much fun I had on longboards. You know, it was pure. The people were fun, more fun to surf with. It wasn't this aggro, I'm going to be Kelly Slater business going on. Yeah. It wasn't this, you know, little dickheads in the water screaming at you. And <laughs> it's like, I just had a lot of fun. And then, so Doug and I started working on some boards and there's always a magic board. And you, you have a shaper like Doug, or you have any really good shaper. You, they come up with a magic board. They come up yeah. with a board that never are you ever going to duplicate. So I got a hold of Doug and I said, Doug, I need you to make three boards. I want a nine foot, a nine six, and a ten foot, and I want your magic boards. You know, so we went through all these boards until we got three magic boards. And then I scanned them on the computer, and then I took them. Uh, started in Thailand, and then I took them into China. And we started making composite boards, but the boards we made them from were the best magic boards. You know, they had all of the things to them that you want, and then and then the deal is, is that you make that same board over and over and over again. So. You can make a board that you can screw up and you want to, you, you're never going to replace that board with a hand shaped board. You know? right. You're never going to do it. Right. Uh, and so now you can do that, but it didn't catch in the marketplace. You know, the, the guys, it's like I say, surfers and skaters are retarded. Because surfers <laughs> are using 60s technology and skaters are using 70s technology. And then the way I prove it is, is we made snowboards in the 90s. And in the 96 Olympics in Japan, we had a rider that was 18. He was a Swiss kid, came from Marosa. He's a lumberjack or a logger. His family was into logging. And so we knew that it was going to be in Japan, and we knew the snow was going to be either really sloppy or really icy. And so we made some snowboards with the step rails on them to handle the different conditions and then like we got a surfboard yeah like a surfboard but putting all of the good stuff in it that you can't put in a surfboard because nobody will buy you know all of the technology wow. all of the internal parts to it you know the wood and the carbon and the pre-pregs and so all that composite shit. that you think yeah you're right if i was to give you that snowboard or i made a pair of skis you couldn't ski them because they were way over your head but this kid was young and strong so he was ranked 32 going into the Olympics for the finals in the half pipe. And he won it. He got a gold medal. And I was paying him 30 grand a year. And we had the wax wired and we had the boards wired. And that's technology. That's the technology that goes into it. Now, a surfer can take a six foot board, which, which weighs about eight or nine pounds. And we can bring that down to a four pound board. And so once you put a surfer that's doing air on a four pound board, it changes everything. It changes the whole scope of stuff. And you go back to Jason Collins, Rat Boy, and his boards were always in four or five pound range because he always used EPS and real lightweight. And he flew with those boards. But everybody would get caught up on using the polyester 
system. He was using epoxy and EPS. So that's why I say that these guys are held back, you know, opposed to other things like bicycles. Technology plays a big role in bicycles. The buyers of bicycles read technology, absorb technology. They want new technology. Skiers, you buy a set of skis. I worked with Vocal for about five years. And the core of that ski and the skins of that ski are going to be the same for five to eight years. What's going to change is the graphics. And you're going to be, you're going to get sucked in every year to a new pair of skis because you think they're new. Right. You know, it's like, oh, wow, this is, but it's not. It's the same <laughs> it's shit. Designed. But you're convinced because of the technology that you're being progress, perceived value. And you, you know, you go through this thing. And, and Vocal was, they grew their own wood. They had really clean factories. Wow. You know. We did, we were in the snowboard business and parabolic skis were just coming into play and Volker yeah. was a scared, was afraid to do it. So I said, look at, as a gag, let me make some skis, parabolic skis under the Santa Cruz label and we'll go push it out there. If it fails, it doesn't matter it, because it's a snowboard company making skis. And, but if it succeeds, you don't get any, you know, you can pick up the good part of it. Yeah. So we sold about 10,000 pair of skis, maybe 20. And, but then the parabolic ski took off, you know, then they shortened and widened it and did all these things. Well, Volko, Volko screwed me on the deal because they wouldn't make them the next year for me. Uh, and I was, I didn't want to. So you were there. That's one of those missed it by. <clears throat> well, it's one of those things. If I would have been smarter, I would have signed a contract with them that said, you get, you have to make this for me for five years and I need all your technology in making this thing. You know? Yeah. But, I had an Italian partner and I had a German partner at the time and we were more, we were doing 220,000 snowboards a year. Wow. So we had, we had Sims and Santa Cruz and then we'd make pickup brands for like Japanese stores and uh, other stores. So we had all this shit going on and it was just another overload to pull in the skis. But again, if we could have wrapped it up somehow, we would have been, in the parabolic ski business, but right. the, the people that buy skis, they live on technology. Yeah. People that buy skateboards, it's a seven ply. It's, we were the first people to put it out in the seventies. It's the same thing over and over. And that's what people still want. That's what they, yeah. That's why they're retarded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, love, I love a guy who calls his customers retarded. So when did you see skateboarding? I mean, because you correct me if you think this is unfair, but I mean, you're the guy who got that. You're, I would call you the category designer of the market. I mean, you made skateboarding at scale. Yeah. Is that, is that fair? Uh, there was You're, about five or six of us yeah. that, that were, were on the game. Jimmy Phillips said that I made him a skateboard in 1961 when I had the surf shop, which could possibly be true because we were screwing around with them at that time. And we were laminating sheets up for fins and so. And it was all roller skate stuff. The skateboard thing, they had Makaha and Vitapak in the 60s. And then in the early 70s, they just carried that fat over into the early 70s. And then that thing kind of died out. <clears throat> and um, we had run into a kid, Tony Roderick. His father worked for a marathane company that built rollers for adding machines and all this shit. But it had precision bearings in it. And, and at the same time, this guy, Nasworthy, picked up a urethane roller skate wheel, which was loose ball bearings. You know, so we... We took a big shot at, well, let me go back first of all to get into skateboards. In 19, when I got done with the music business, I went into the reinforced plastic business. So I controlled all of the raw materials for Northern California for surfboards, sailboats, uh, chemical toilets, tomato uh, packaging and stuff. The plastic stuff. It's called reinforced. It's fiberglass, basically fiberglass got cloth it. and epoxies and stuff. So. But it's a shitty business because there was only 11% margin on it. So it was all dealt in volume. And in the middle 60s, or in, right around 63, I did all the, uh, the laminating with Dion Shamrock for it's a resin called 6908 that was developed straight for surfboards. So I did all their, their, uh, their testing on the timing of when these things would go off. So you know, you see Jack with a big bucket of foam coming up between his legs. Well, you'd see me with a burning bucket of resin with cyanide poison. Oh, it's okay. cyanide, yeah. cyanide poison coming up in my nose with no mask, you know. <laughs> so in 1969, I went back to the well and I said, you know, this is what I'm doing. And I want this resin for Northern California. And they were more than happy to give it to me. So I had exclusives on that resin. So then I went to Grubby and I said, hey, I'm doing this. And, you know. I want your blanks. So 
so he made me the blank guy in Northern California. Then I went to Owens Corning and Hexel and got their cloth and mat and roving. And then I went to a company called Royale in San Mateo. And I had this guy teach me how to do warehousing. And, uh, you know, for, I had the knowledge of using the stuff, but I didn't have the vocabulary that went with it. So he taught me, a guy named Bob Ting taught me all that, that crap. So we got into this business uh, around 1969. This being skateboards. This this was not even skateboards. This was reinforced plastic. Just reinforced plastic. Yeah. 69. 69. And then in the early 70s, this guy named Tracy Nelson started a company called the Fiberglass Works. And he built motorcycle fairings like for Evil Knievel and all these guys. He's all these fancy fairings. Well, his wife gets killed in an auto accident on Highway 17. And they don't have insurance on her, but they have insurance on him. So the government comes in and wipes him out, 56% of his business. They just wanted the cash, and so it bankrupted him. And when it bankrupted him, he owed me about $10,000, me and my partner, Jay. And um, <clears throat> we had no means of collecting the money because there was nothing to collect. There was nothing to collect. Yeah, so uh, this friend of mine, Jimmy Hoffman, was in Hawaii, and he, um, he uh, uh, said, hey, I got this place called McCulley Sports, and they want 500 skateboards can you guys do it? And we go, yeah, because we were doing protruded stuff and all this, you know, for sheet fins and things. So we made 500 protruded uh, skateboards. We used sure grip trucks and uh, roller sport wheels, loose ball bearing stuff. And how many other people were making skateboards? Uh, there was time? a bunch of guys in Southern California. That yeah. All the same. The roller skate industry, there's five families that control the roller skate industry. And all of the components going into skateboards, except for the decks, were roller skate components. So these, if you wanted to buy popcorn for your roller rink, you had to go to these five families. If you yeah. wanted to buy trucks for your skateboards, you had to go to one of these five families. Wow. So we built 500 boards and they sold. And Jay and I looked at the margins and wow, this is a lot better than surf surfboards. <laughs> surfboards suck. <laughs> so we made another 500 and they sold like that. You know, snap. We went, wow, this is pretty cool. And we were working out of a chicken coop with dirt floors. And uh, so we went, Fuck, this is, no, so we, so we got into the skateboard business, you know, we put a couple of ads and we we're one of the first groups of guys to do it. So then this kid, Tony Roderick comes down, a guy named Mike Mitchell sent him from O'Neill's shop down to talk to us because O'Neill's had no interest in it. And he had an idea. We call it, it eventually became the road rider wheel and it was precision bearings. And his father was the marathon guy that had precision bearings in the rollers for his computer machines and stuff at the time. So we put this thing together. We uh, looked at it. It was each wheel was the cost of four normal roller skate wheels for one wheel. We went, this is, you know, if this thing catches, it's going to be really good. But the odds of it catching because skateboards were 1995 and 2995 then with all this work. So we went, Jesus, you know, so we did this wheel and it took off on us and, uh, and took off to the point that one of the roller skate families went to our vendors and it told them that if they didn't give them our product, that he was going to cut off, cut them off of skateboard trucks. So the only way that my partner Jay and I knew how to solve it was to go down and beat the shit out of them. <laughs> <laughs> they were from Laguna Beach. And this guy, Joe Nazaro up in uh, Palo Alto or uh, Menlo Park called us up and he was one of the roller skate family guys. He says, you guys can't do that. That's not the way it's done. We, well, this guy's screwing with us. You know, you, this is the way we take care of stuff. We don't call lawyers. So he talked us out of it and he guaranteed us trucks. But at the same time that we were doing the road rider wheel, Ron Bennett was doing a skateboard truck. You know, he was taking the same geometry off a sure grip truck and he made an actual skateboard truck with a bigger base plate. And at that same time, uh, Dave McIntyre was working for Gordon and Smith and they were doing composite skateboards. And then Bill Bain was doing the Cadillac stuff at the time, which was still roller skate, but he had bought in Chicago trucks and he was making trucks for them. So we all kind of came together at a, at a contest and trade show in Southern California. We all kind of like, wow, we got an industry here. And so we said, well, let's start meeting. So we all started meeting as the Dave McIntyre, Bill Bain, Brian Logan, Dave Dominey, Sherman, myself, and Ron Bennett. It was the first group. And so we all sat down and we said, well, we can't price fix, but let's margin it. Let's make sure, because we all come from the surf industry, we don't fuck this thing up. 
And so we made our margins to where the cost of manufacturing allowed for a distributor, allowed for a retailer, but allowed for skateboard teams, promotion, marketing, advertising, blah, blah, blah. And so we took the formula that guys like the Hoffman brothers and Gordon Clark and the guys that did Hang 10 and uh, Lightning Bolt and Jammers, and we used that advertising formula, which was an Axon Sports advertising formula, which where you go into a magazine like Surfer or Skateboarder or something, and your ads are low, but you reach your marketplace because they were doing a couple hundred thousand or hundred thousand copies a month. And so we, we started that, we took that formula, our formula, and we started marrying it together. And the idea of it was, is that if we could grow an industry, and our job would be to take what we can out of that industry. We weren't trying to put the other guy out of business. We just wanted you our were building the category. Yeah, we just wanted a chunk of it. The market yeah. had to exist first before you before could you could something. fight for it. Yeah, and everybody there was had enough confidence in themselves that they could get their niche out of this market. So there was it was more of a comrades rather than competitors yeah. at the time. And so we made. And we, so people ended up in various niches over time, yeah, right? Guy made like Dave Nominee would only make trucks. You right. know, uh, we were really kind of hung up on wheels, and then we started doing decks and stuff. Uh, when uh, did the design part, uh, <coughs> the, the graphics, and so that forth? That was all in the '80s. That came in the '80s. Yeah, there was. Uh, uh, let's see, who was it that Phillips was the one that got us going on it? He'd bring graphics in and say, "Well, you got to put these on skateboards," and we were going, "Oh shit!" You know, we we didn't know how to screen or anything we were doing the screening ourselves you know right so he you know well, okay well let's just try this you know and the same and then we were the first guys to start with graphics and that was in the late 70s and then we tried to carry it over in the 80s but our graphics in the 70s were pretty basic checkered board suit stuff like that you know the 80s got into the real graphic art where we learned how to screen and learned how to print so we could go you know we could take a Jimmy was so good that he could cut his screens where we could do a four color lay down and it would turn into 12 colors with overlays, you know, and he was way ahead of the, the, the deal on that one. And is that what opened the door ultimately to what we have today where you really <coughs> the 70s, intricate? The seventies opened the door, the early seventies to 74 to around 77 because we said we, what we wanted to do was we didn't want to get it into a subjective sport because subjective sports, there's never really a real winner. It's mostly who's got the better politics that's going to win it. So if you're, you know, if you're Kelly Slater, you go into a contest, you automatically have 20 points, you know, so everybody yeah. else has to make, make up that width, you know. And so we wanted to do racing. So we wanted to have the fastest person down the hill on a clock that would, you know, it would be a true winner. There'd be no argument that this guy, right. you know, this guy won, period. There's yeah. nothing you he can He started say. here, ended and, there, and done. fast. And so we pushed the racing thing. We did ABC Wide World of Sports. We did CBS. We did NBC. We did all these programs, you know, and, and promoted it out. And then in the late, uh, the late seventies is when we really got a big push from the baby boomers and they started getting into drainage ditches and vert. So we had to kind of shut down the racing business and then switch our whole momentum into vert or vert skating pools, yeah. and things like that. And that at 1979, the industry, I went from 18. And that's really the beginning, isn't it, of today what we would call X game type sports? And that came a little bit later. No, that, but it's, that's the seed, isn't it? That was the seed that planted the vert. I mean, you always wanted to skateboard to emulate surfing. And I mean, so, was there a, was there a half pipe in skiing before that? No, right. No, they they would use the sides of mountains to do it. With. Sure, you know, you would bank off a mountain, but not a man made. No, maybe somewhere had it, but I never saw it. Right. But uh, in '79, we went from 18 and 20 million dollars a year in one year down to 400 thousand. That's how the, the door slammed on the skateboard industry. What? Yeah. Wow. That's it's slam, totally slam. So you go into the seven, you had companies like GNS and you had uh, all these companies that no longer existed in the eighties. We were the only company to come out of it in the eighties. Uh, and we didn't come out of it very good. I just was able to pull us, pull this shit together in the eighties, you know? So the eighties almost killed skateboarding. 79 and 79, my partner dies of leukemia. Um, our business goes from 20 million down to 400,000. 
And I'm left with, after the death and figuring out all the thing, I kept one building and the trade names. That's all I kept in whatever debt. And I started all over again. And how old were you, Rich? Uh, it's 19, let's see, 1980. I was 38, <laughs> 37, actually, when Jay died. So the biggest kick in the balls life can give you, yeah, really. I, Jay and I had built the business. We went into the skateboard business. We fixed the margins. We took it internationally. We had the whole international market figured out. Uh, we knew what we wanted to do. We knew we, we knew how to do it. We were confident in ourselves at the time to do all this shit. And then, you know, we wanted to make, we had about $8,000 a month each coming in from what we had saved and the real estate we had bought. To, and so we were just going to go back to the beach and go surfing. That's all our goal was just to go surfing. We didn't want to fucking work. <laughs> I just wanted to fucking surf. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, we needed a way to, cause there was no careers in Santa Cruz at the time. And we refused to go to Santa Clara. I and mean, that's where all the kooks lived. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, um, you know, and then that just collapsed on me. And so I started, I had to start out again in the eighties uh, with nothing minus nothing. And I had three workers, Tim Pumarda, Burl Dunton, and uh, this other kid, Steve. And that was it. And so when do things like, you know, the Santa Cruz dot become the Santa Cruz dot? And, uh, the Santa Cruz dot, the Santa Cruz deal came about in the middle 60s on surfboards, mainly Santa Cruz surfboards. With the, with the red dot that no, we know we today. didn't do the dot. The dot came along in the 70s. Jimmy came up with the dot, I think around 75 or 76. And um, we needed to, to establish a, tr a mark. You know, I, I always thought that names like Sims or, you know, three or four letter words were perfect for marketing because they're very, they're, you, you don't have to go a lot of places. Santa Cruz was a lot of letters. You know, it's like, oh, I got all these letters to work with. How do I market this stuff? How do I get it to be visible on, you know, a skateboard or a surfboard? And so Jimmy came up with a dot that was fairly recognizable in any either black and white or colored films. And so we, okay, that's going to be our mark. So you really wanted something identifiable on the board that says this is. Yeah. You know, Rosinal has the rooster on the tip yeah. of the skis. Nike has the swish, you know, has, has any of them ever switched to another one? No, no. That's, and that's the biggest battle you have in businesses. Having these guys coming in, they're going to upgrade your marks. Well, please don't touch it. You yeah. Know, that's the mark. You know, don't, don't fuck with that thing. That's going to, you know, you're just going to have to recreate a visual because now it's a subconscious visual. People look and they go, Oh, that's the dot. It, you know, rather than going, what's that? It, 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 it's the, it's the flag of the County. I mean, for, for all practical yeah. no, purposes, it's, it's, right? We I mean, did a good job with that one. It is the most <laughs> visible thing in town yeah. for sure. And the, here's the thing I love about it. I'm in Edinburgh, Scotland, visiting my aunt and I see it. High school kids wearing it. Yeah. And so when did it become this fashion brand that we now see everywhere mm. around the world? It goes, I mean, it goes through spurts, you know, and we, we really kind of established the mark in the eighties because we really got strong internationally and we had a strong skateboard team, we had a strong snowboard team in the nineties. Um, what we had when we began is we, we had a only thing that we could trademark was the stylized lettering. That was it. So it's for us to protect the mark, uh, it would have to be in that content, which you see is the slanted lettering. And when we applied for an international trademark on the word, we couldn't because it was a geographic location. So about eight or nine years ago, we hired this paralegal and she started taking punches at uh, the trademark rules. And so finally, the trademark office was convinced that Santa Cruz was no longer a geographic location. It was a, it was a clothing design. So we got the trademark on anything with Santa Cruz on it, any piece of clothing with Santa Cruz on it, unless it says uh, California on the bottom, we can go after now. Wow. So if I want to print a t-shirt that says Santa Cruz on it, I owe you money unless it says California underneath the Santa Cruz. Yeah. And California has to be a certain height compared to the lettering. And so we wow. send a lot of C and D's, you know. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? Novak, you own the fucking <laughs> word Santa Cruz. That's crazy. Yeah. So we did that, and then we <laughs> and we pulled it all over. And we have eighty distributors all over the world. So all we do is just fill in the, you know, just fill it in for them. You know, go for it. And today, what percentage of the business is surf, skate, 
and and you know merge clothing um soft goods surf is pretty much nothing now i mean it's kind of it's for everybody it's been really bad uh, i think a lot to do with the costco boards and a lot to do with people that really Which don't is know another fucking thing i don't understand i surfed that one that wave storm once and i thought why the fuck would i surf this this spongy piece of shit when i could surf a custom hot board like what is wrong with people and to your point like okay the costco board's 200 bucks let's say the hot board is 1200 bucks okay it's a thousand bucks but you, you take that amortized over the waves who gives a fuck right it's, it's the most horrible ride I, I they suck i don't understand that well it's just the way it is you know it's yeah Again, it goes back to respecting your artist or respecting the person that made, the craftsman. You know, like you say, if if you were to pay Doug as a craftsman, his boards would be ten or fifteen thousand uh, dollars. They they gotta be. Yeah, I mean, Yader did a thing with uh, Enzel, who's an artist, and Yader's a shaper, and they put together this board that had abalone shells in it, and they did this really cool art surfboard, a Yader surfboard, which he's a legend, and then Enzel is a legend in his own art form. And uh, it sold for seventeen thousand dollars, and that was a high point in the surf industry of yeah. a brand new surfboard selling for seventeen thousand dollars. Nobody had ever heard of anything like that, you know, yeah. unless it was a classic board that somebody did something with, you know. So, and yeah. then that Paul Newman watch goes for seventeen million bucks. <laughs> yeah. You saw that, yeah. right? And you got these. I mean, it's just it always amazed me, and that's why we did skateboards because skateboards we we did the world we. Uh, we controlled the business. We did. We, we had a formula that they held to until the nineties and we're just kind of getting it back now. But um, it was just a lot easier and a lot, you know, surfboards is a really hard life. I mean, you're sucking chemicals all day long. I mean, I, I spent 20 years making surfboards, 15, 20 years making surfboard. And I was up to my elbows in acetone with no gloves, no mask and the sanding, <laughs> you know, you, you, sometimes I listen to Doug's coughing and he's got silk, you know, he's got foam in his lungs, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, you don't get paid for it. It's no. a, you know, well, even if you did, you got a foam in your fucking lungs. Right? Yeah. yeah. And a lot of guys uh, died of silicosis of the lungs from that. A lot of the power shapers out of LA, a lot of them went down hard. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, you get, it's just a, it's a weird world. It's cool. And, you know, people with money are getting into it now. And, you know, they have, I, I think I had a line one time is if you knew how much money I, I had, I, you would give me all the waves. Like, you know, why would I do that? <laughs> Some guy. Give you all that, the waves. Yeah. And, because this guy was yeah. wealthy. He moved in from Silicon Valley, had a house on the point, and Now he wants all the waves. You know, it's like, Dude, you got to work for that one. Yeah, you got to work. Yeah, that was that was being polite. I mean, yeah, pretty much you don't surf here anymore. (laughs) Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, one of the things that's amazed me about Santa Cruz is I have had a profound sense of experience or a profound experience of community or tribe here. People say hello and good morning, and the friends that we've made here are have become family, and. Uh, we know our neighbors, you know, Hall- Halloween comes and we get, uh, we go to uh, BevMo sells the, um, the airline size booze bottles. Yeah. <laughs> so we get booze to give to the parents and, you know, we all have fun with each other on Halloween, et cetera, et cetera. And so Santa Cruz to me feels, you know, like an incredible community. It was just voted as the number two happiest place in the country. Yeah, I read that. A lot of stone people. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's a, I, I'm glad I was raised here. It gave me a good life. I was raised in Capitola. Um, I can go back to my mother's great grandfather in Capitola. Wow. Um, but, yeah, I just think I was really lucky. Yeah, I mean, I could have been raised in Fresno. You know, I'm yeah. an eighth generation California dirt farmer on my mother's side. I could have been raised in Modesto or Turlock or something because if my parents hadn't turned this direction, I probably would have. And the cool thing, though, Rich, I mean, I, I, I wonder how much you reflect. I mean, you've had as much to do. You're as iconic a, a, uh, a person in Santa Cruz that there is. So, yeah, it took a while. I'm 75 too. 
So yeah, you're, but I mean, you always get to be a legend. Contributions, you know, you've created yeah. industries, helped to create industries. Your contribution to surfing speaks for itself. Obviously, you're the principal creator of, of the skateboarding industry, or certainly yeah. one of them. Uh, you own the word Santa Cruz for the love of God. That's, <laughs> I, that's, that's my best one. I that, think. That's, that's gotta actually make you Mr. Santa Cruz. <laughs> I actually owe that to Marie Ricci. She's the one that pulled that off for me. She was the paralegal. Yeah. We were using this legal firm in San Jose and they were charging us a fortune and we had these trademark infringements going on. And I went over there one day and I went, Look, who does the actual work? And we spotted her over there. So then we hired her. <laughs> so great. And she lived, Fortunately, she lived over by Watsonville, and she wanted to quit commuting. I mean, she just pulled a miracle with that one. I, I tried for years to do that, and she was able so to pull great. that one. Yeah, it's cool. It's pretty neat. We we got it. We're trying to figure so out what about we the own. other companies that have Santa Cruz in their name, like nothing you can do about it. Santa Cruz guitars or Santa yeah, Cruz bikes. Nothing, they have it's Santa Cruz guitars or Santa Santa Cruz bike. Uh, that was me. Uh, oh, that was you. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Me and Rob, an old skater from Ohio. You guys make great bikes. Yeah, they're really good. Really good bikes. Yeah. 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 My first real cross-country um, mountain bike was a Santa Cruz bike, and it changed my life. Oh, it's – we did uh, – Rob was – I got Rob. Why did I think that was somebody else? Wow. Because I left Rob as the face of that. Oh, Okay. So Rob was a skater for me, Rob Roscoff. And he was about 19 when I met him. And a guy named Fausto Vitello introduced me to him, who's my partner with Independent and Thrasher Magazine. And um, Which I also would love to talk to you about. I think <laughs> a lot of things. You're, maybe this you're a magazine. Two, two shows. <laughs> you're a magazine tycoon, which is kind of yeah, cool. It was a hard one. We didn't know what we were doing. We lucked out. But Rob was a skater. And when he came up, I said, listen, Rob, I said, you know, you, you can have a really good life about 10 years. You can travel all over the world. You'll make a lot of money. You'll have a lot of girls. You know, you'll do all these things. But in about 10 years, this thing's going to come to a crashing halt. If you can absorb 10% of what I, I'm going to teach you and you can save your money, at the end of 10 years, you got a good start on life. You can just, it, you can take off. Well, he did pretty close to everything that I had asked or I told him. And then at the end of 10 years, when the career came to an end, I, I brought him in the house and I said, okay, let's create a business. So I gave him, I had Sim skateboards at the time and I gave him Sims. I said, put together this business. And of course it failed and I knew it was going to fail. Um, and he, and I said, well, why did this fail? What, what was, what was the problem here? And he goes, well, I don't know. I did this. I got the team. And I said, it failed because your timing was off. You missed the timing. You know, you were too, you pulled the trigger too early. So we, I was into riding mountain bikes at the time and he started riding and he said, I want to race. Uh, I want to, I want to, race the uh, kamikaze run at mammoth and so paul turner the guy that did rock shocks uh keith bontrager was the guy that helped him make that shock and paul turner was a friend of mine and so paul had the front shocks wired so we hired this guy tom morrison to design a an engineer to design a rear shock and we came out with this bike called the tasman took rob down to mammoth and pushed him off the top and crossed our fingers i hope he's gonna <laughs> live i mean it's if, i don't know if you've ever seen this thing this is like death it's like jumping off a cliff with a bicycle in your crotch and not a very good bicycle at the time. It had suspension, but that's about all it had. And Rob's really strong. He came in, I think he won the expert division. So afterwards we're sitting there talking and he goes, well, what do we do now? And I said, well, let's start a bike company. I said, I'll loan you the name and I don't want to work so you can do all the work. And so we started punching away at the bicycle company and um, we Luckily, about two, two or three years into it, we stumbled on the VPP patent. We, put, we bought that. Mm -hmm. And it just we decided to take the upper end suspension market and charge a lot of money for it because like Specialize and Trek, they were, their main market was 300 to $1,200. And that's, that's the battle they were fighting. Their upper end market was just something they had to have. Yeah, I want to say my, uh, I think it was called the Blur XC. Does yeah, that sound right? Yeah. I want to say I bought that bike probably would 12 years ago be about right. Yeah. 12 ish. Well, went by fast. Yeah. And I'm going to guess I was maybe at the door for six G's. Probably. We got you. <laughs> yeah. Would that be about right? Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of fucking yeah, money. Did, yeah. You probably went with a 
XTR shit and all the high end stuff. I did all the super. XTR alone wholesale was like sixteen hundred bucks, seventeen hundred bucks. So retail it's twice that. Yeah, I I had a blur XT. I rode it a lot, and I was at a coffee shop one day, and some guy rode up on exactly the same bike, and he told me he's he's got a really good deal on this thing. He just paid you know fifty eight hundred dollars for it, and I went. He said, "How much you pay for yours?" And I go, "You know, shit, man. I paid more than that. You really beat me." (laughs) Yeah, I paid a lot to be on this fucking bike. (laughs) So what we decided to do that we can. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's an incredible company. Yeah, it it was. uh, Did a good job with that one. You know, it was was Rob. Rob was the front guy. I'd come in and. And do you still own it, or where where did it land? We. Oh, about four years ago, Rob, I sat down with Rob and I said, you're really going hard, man. How much you got left in you? And he said, yeah, about five years left in him. And we needed a strategic partner for Europe. So we started getting all these VC guys marching through with, you know, we're going to give you all this money, but we're going to fuck you at the end. And I I already heard that story. And um, so we found this company called Pawn in Amsterdam. And Palm was a family held company. The guy that started it designed the first Volkswagen bus on a napkin in 1947. Wow. And uh, they were interested in us and they had the positioning that we needed for Europe because we were growing really fast. So we were going to sell out 30%, and they come in and talked us into selling out more of it. And we talked to Rob, and Rob was pretty done. And he was, he's in, you know, it's 51 or 52. I go, dude, you know, he said, let's go for it. Let's declare victory. Yeah. yeah and, and so we sold and we both retain uh, about 20% uh, between us, 17 yeah. and a half percent between us, or about yeah. 20% between us. And, you know, we'll probably dump out on that in a year or two. And he's, right. he signed a five year contract and gets a lot of money. And, He's a good guy. He's a really good. I mean, so the I, movie really ends well for Rob on this one. Yeah, and Rob yeah. Rob deserves it. You know, he's yeah. he's he's one of the things I learned about kids from the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana is they have a really good sense of values. And um, when you, I have got like Jeff Kendall is the vice president of my company. He's from Indiana. And he's just got really good values. Yeah. And if you have somebody that's a really good athlete that knows how to win and has really good values. And then you start working with them, you know, and training them. And it takes, you know, you'll lose some on the way because they'll get all horny and shit, you know. But, <laughs> you know, you gain, I, I was, I've been able to retain these guys. And they're, you know, they're getting into the point of where you're going to have to run this thing now. I'm not done, you know. Yeah. I'll sit down and have lunch with you and drink wine and I'll, t- I'll tell you what I would do. But that's not necessarily what you are going to do. And I'm not asking you to do that. I just tell you how I solved the problem. Yeah. So, and I did that with Rob. He'd come up with a problem, you know, and I'd go in and fix his problem. You know, he'd go out with, come in with, you know, I don't know how many people I fired or bought out for him, you know, just to get rid of them because we saw that they were roadblocks or micromanagers or egos or something. Just, so I would be the henchman to come in and say, okay, well, this is over with. <laughs> you just give them a whack. Uh, well, a couple of them I really enjoyed doing. Most of them were, well intended, but undereducated for where we were going. You know, it's just, they didn't want to improve themselves. And it's true in any business, you know, you, you'd ask about the Santa Cruz brand, you know, as a, it's an international clothing brand. We do it all through I South America and Europe. I, I, but what percentage of people around the world who wear this clothing even know Santa Cruz is a place? No, that's, that's where, how we got the deal. You go to yeah. Barcelona, you ask them about Santa Cruz clothing and it's a clothing company. It's not a geographic location. Yeah. And it's a, for a lot of skaters, it's an, it's a, you know, it's like the Messiah. You can go, go to the, yeah, go, to, go to worship at the shrine. I don't know. Yeah. You tell me if this is fair. It's, it's Harley Davidson. Yeah. It's a skateboarding and yeah. surfing. And, um, but it, it's, it's been really good. I and mean, I've really been lucky. And how did you get into the magazine business? Oh, because <laughs> So in the late, 70s well around 75 and 76 jay and i were trying to own the racing business and skateboard so we made this thing called independent suspension truck which was based on the same design as a formula one suspension system where you had independent rocker arms for each wheel and so what we would do is lay down underneath a glass deal and have skaters move on the top to see how much urethane we could get on the glass of a regular skateboard 
uh, truck is based on negative turns. So every time you turn the truck, you just get the edge of the wheel on the, ed on the side. So you didn't have really good traction. So we figured if we could get four on the floor, four wheels on the ground, and we could get at least 40 to 50% traction on each wheel, we could go faster and turn harder. We could put more pressure into so it. Keep the wheel on the road. Keep the wheel on more. the road. This is a formula car does. When the, when the weight goes this way, the wheel goes and touches the road. So then we made pre-impregnated -impreg pre carbon skateboards that were guys that were skating at the time. When they pushed down on the board, they had to bring the board back up because there was nothing to shoot it back up. So we took carbon, figured how to use carbon minorly as a, a suspension with a suspension system to where when you shoved everything into the ground, you wouldn't have to bring the board back up or the wheels back up, it would shoot you back up. So you could pre you could save 50% of your energy and strength by doing this thing. And it worked. We owned the world. We owned the racing world with that. Wow. One. So that was not a big seller because racing was going south. Oh, oh, hey, yeah. B and, bummer, but yeah. awesome, awesome yeah, technology. Good idea. Yeah. yeah. Good Way to go on the product. We didn't make any money on it, but it, we won. We did what we wanted to do. We won the races we wanted to win, and we marketed it such that they could buy the relative products. So at the same time, a couple guys in San Francisco that were motorcycle mechanics made a truck called the Stroker, which was looked the same, but all it was was a truck where the wheels turn. It didn't have any suspension to it. They just turn, and that didn't sell. So we ran into them at uh, Signal Hill in Long Beach one time on a downhill deal, and uh, <clears throat> we talked to them. They were nice guys, and uh, so we kept in contact. But they could build these suspension trucks for us. So we had them starting to build our trucks because they mechanically, they had all the mechanics that went with it. So then uh, the Vert started coming in. Those kind of trucks kind of went south. We did a rebound truck with them, which was a total arm breaker. And then we sat down and my partner goes up to him and he said, here's a tracker truck and here's a Bennett truck. We're going to make a truck that wears like a tracker and turns like a Bennett. And we're going to name it Independent Trucks. And so, so the best of what you did and the best of what we did. Yeah, this mainly they didn't, it was, it, we took two of the trucks that actually worked. The, the tracker at the time was the most durable truck, but it didn't turn very well. The Bennett truck was not very durable, but it turned really well. So we wanted the turning radius and also the wear and tear. Yeah. So we made the independent truck. That's how it came about. And what, what year is this, Rich? 76, 77. Yeah. So they were in San Francisco. They were... I mean, they were the same as we were at the beginning. They were just shoestringing it, you know. They, yeah, they they did a pretty good job of bullshitting us and stuff. But we did it, and we came out with it. Well, just as we came out with the independent truck, and that's when Skateboarder Magazine was the biggest magazine around. Right. The market collapses, and so I am left with uh, Santa Cruz and independent trucks and Road Rider wheels, which has already gone south on me. So I really have. I don't have anything. My partner's dead. Um, Life's got, hard. Life, it sucks. It's not a really good year. Yeah. So I look at what I have as assets. And the only thing I have as assets is these three employees that I kept on and these two guys in the city. And I figured if I could, you know, we have a new brand, we have a truck brand, and these guys were highly motivated. So if I could have a buy-in with these guys, and then I could rebuild – my side from the other side and then we would use skateboarder magazine as a vehicle to go right back Tell to the, the original world. formula and start it all over again good plan uh <laughs> so we did that and we one of the guys wives worked for feinstein's they got us a warehouse uh up in hunter's point in naval shipyards for a penny a square foot we just put all this shit together it's a long story so we got going. We didn't have any money. We were, so I had to create something to make money. So I found two train loads of blank wood from the 70s in Wisconsin. So I bought them all for 20 cents a blank. And so then I found a whole bunch of wheels in Maryland and then the bearings from all the bearing companies. Got everything for like a nickels and dimes, just cheap. So I said, okay, what we're going to do is I'm going to buy trucks at OEM pricing from you. And I'm going to put this skateboard together called the Jammer. And then we're going to march forward together and sell the shit out of it. And this is how we're going to finance the construction of a foundry and rebuilding of NHS. This is, this is how this is going to work. So uh, we did it. 
and it worked. And so why did it work? I don't know. We're just lucky. You know, it was just the right time. You know, skateboarding was early 80s, just coming just, back you in. You could feel the market coming back. Yeah, it was, you know, it was a good industry. You know, we did, we laid a really good foundation in the 70s. Is, I think Where was I Tony back. Hawk in this? These or guys are it... changing diapers. <clears throat> yeah. These guys are skaters. They're not, they're not part of the business world. They're part of the skating world. This yeah. is the dip, there's, there's guys that put the industry together and there's guys that benefited from putting it no, no, together. I get that, but is, is an athlete like that, does he make a big difference in the growth of the, the category? Well, uh, they make a big difference in uh, how you market something in that you utilize them to be the spokesman for your products. And so which you, this is where I go back to Midwestern values. So you get a guy like Kendall or Roscoff or these guys, and they have these really good values. So they know if they're riding your product to, you know how a skier puts a ski up and it says Vulcan or something on the yeah. bottom, Vulcan or Rosinol or something. Yeah. Well, skaters wouldn't do that. They hide the brands. But these guys, when they got up, they went, this is us. This is, we won this contest. Santa Cruz. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, <clears throat> so I had these guys, you know, I had them, uh, they were making good money, had them going. So I go down to a meeting in uh, Dana Point with Skateboarder Magazine, which was owned by Surfer Publications. And this guy, D. David Moran, and this other guy, tells us that they're going to change the name of the magazine to Action Now, and that we were going to be allowed to pay them 80% of the advertising costs, but we were only going to get 30% of the coverage. And I really didn't think that was a good deal. I thought that pretty sucked, <laughs> you know, and I was supposed to buy this program and I, and I actually tape recorded the, the meeting. So I go back up and I grab the guys in San Francisco and I, we had this one place called cafe sport on green street that we pretty much put every one of our deals together. So we went down, got ripped, drank wine, ate Italian, Sicilian food. And we put this thing together. We're going to go into the magazine business. Well, do you know, because anything? if skateboarders going away, yeah, we need to them. do, our, we'll own do thing. our own thing. Fuck you know? them. Yeah. So we didn't know what we were doing. Nobody had done a magazine before. Nobody really was, could do anything. So one of the guys, uh, Eric Swenson, he was the actual uh, nuts and bolts to the foundry. He said, okay, Eric, you take the foundry over. Uh, Fausto, you take the team and I'll take all the rest of the responsibility as far as distribution money and stuff. And we'll start a magazine. So we we're going, well, what format should we use? And we said, well, let's use Hot Rod magazine and um what was that music magazine rolling stone like rolling stone yeah yeah and so we used the rolling stone format as size and we used hot rod magazine as content and so that was how we started we made about and a how did you come up with the name thrasher yeah i was just was one of the terms that was getting thrown about then you know every you could have could have been kick flip you know it just was thrasher was this this it was a good turn you know it was a real good word but you know, if I fast forward to today, Thrasher, like Santa Cruz, like independent truck company, you've turned into fashion brands. And so I see these young gals, like te teenage gals, walking around with these pink t-shirts that say Thrasher yeah. on them. And uh, they, I, I gotta believe they have no idea it's a, it's a magazine. No, it's just like Hollywood got a hold of it this last couple of years. So that we're getting a lot of push out of Hollywood right now for Thrasher. And it's, yeah, it's the showing, clothing's it's taking showing off. up in spots, yeah. right? I mean, we're kind of really lucky right now because both Santa Cruz and Thrasher are both uh, rising pretty hard right now. And mainly it's, it's, it's a fashion thing. You know, you get, and you only get a certain period of time with this stuff. You know? So you know it's not going to be like this forever. And that's why you carry, that's why I carry 20 or 30 brands. You know, you try to get one going and when it peaks out, you invest in the next one. You think it's going to go up and then down and down that, we could say with Thrasher or with Santa Cruz, we could say, yeah, we can make this thing 200 million, but we got to find the right people to take us to 200 million. But I don't mind doing 30 to 50 million because I make a lot, a lot of money. It's not too stressful. Uh, I make more money than I need. You know, I keep a lot of people working and I don't have to deal with assholes from New York or LA. <laughs> it's pretty that easy. It's that basic. But when you start going big, like, in the 70s when we were doing skateboards there was a guy named jim jinx doing op and one of the formula for clothing in southern california was is you wanted to grow only so big as that you didn't outstrip your marketing tech 
techniques, which was using the advertising things that I explained earlier. And so at that time, it was about 400 million. And you didn't want to exceed that, that amount because then it turns you on to the garment merchants out of New York. And then it changes the whole bottom end of it on your marketing and advertising. So rather than paying $4,000 for a page, you're paying $50,000 for a page. So everybody knew that, you know, going in. And it's the same thing with Santa Cruz clothing or Thrasher clothing. There's a point of where you make a lot of money. You, you're able, if the brand goes south on you, you put it to bed for a while and then you bring it back in four or five years and it goes up again. Whereas if you become OP, you get to the certain point. He got to right. 600 million and he sold. And he was right at the, the edge of that formula. Now, if you go to Quicksilver and Billabong, they took it into the two billion each stage. And what do you have? You have Vanity Fair that owns everything or you have Nike that owns everything. So now you're dealing yeah. with public held companies that don't really give a shit about the hard goods industry or any of that stuff. And that's where it's all sits right now going into the Olympics. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, because they're essentially fashion companies. Well, they're just, no, they're publicly held companies. So every 90 days they have to pay off to their shareholders. Whereas if you're like we are, you're more concerned about your customers and your workers. So that's who your innovation workers that's who you're, and customers, that's your... And so you never thought about taking the company public? No. I, I mean, I, some guy at, in Sand Hill Road wanted to bike, and he was a venture capitalist. And I said, okay, why do you want a bike? You got like billions of dollars. Why don't you just go buy one? Oh, I never pay retail, you know, some lawyer. I go, okay. I'll tell you what, I'll get you a bike at wholesale, but I want three hours of your time telling me how you fuck people over. <laughs> so I get the bike done. I go up there. I get about four espressos, put them on his desk. And he spent four hours from beginning to end of how they, where it ends up for somebody like me, which isn't a good place. I mean, I'll get some money out of it, but you know, I don't, I destroy my workers. I destroy whatever I built because they're only going to milk it until they roll it off and sell it to keepers or somebody else. that's going to put it in box stores. Hmm. So I'm more into the deal of, you know, taking care of my workers and having a longevity to it. And how do you think about succession? Uh, I've got, funny you should say, I got that all covered. Because yeah. I got, you know, one of the guys, an old skater, he's now the president of the company and he's going to step up. And then the vice president guy is going to take his place and he's going to come in more into a board of directors role. And then we've got, you know, we got 20s, we got 20 year olds, we got 30 year olds, we got 40 year olds, and we got 50 year olds. And so out of those batches, you're going to, somebody's going to pop up and they'll just take the next one. And then you give it a really good retirement cushion at the other end. And it's just like you run this thing through and it's a good living. It's fun. And so, so you feel like the company's set up to live long past you. Oh yeah. It, yeah. it should. The way I'm setting it up, it, it should. I mean, there's enough intellectual property. There's enough patents that, and the guys that we're putting in position aren't being, drafted from outside the world they're being coming out from in their home bread i guess you'd say yeah and so their philosophies and their everything is the same you know as ours they have the same goals the same philosophies they have, they care about their employees you know so of course you get a 40 year old is in there that he wants to be core so he's going to go off and be core and then somebody's going to slap him down and then if he's good <laughs> he's going to you know bounce back up and say well that was a not right thing to do <laughs> So, yeah, I think it'll work. I mean, but you're dead, so who cares? <laughs> you do the best you can to set it up, and then you die. Yeah. But there's only so much money you can spend. And none of this, I never did any of this for money. I did it because I enjoyed doing it. I did it because I didn't going to go work for somebody. And it gave you a lot of time to surf, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> shit. The, I mean, that, that's the, the thing I love about the whole dialogue we're having is, it's so clear you're a guy who designed your life and your business together. You yeah. wanted to be a surfer. Well, you do. I try right? to explain this to my nieces and nephews. You want to do a lot of jobs. So, there we go. yeah, you want to do a lot of different jobs so you know what you don't want to do. Right. You know, don't be afraid to go wash dishes or bus or dig holes because if you're smart, you're not going to do that very long. And so I started out early going, fuck, I don't want to do this. Right. I was a garbage man. That sucked. It was a terrible It was really job. shitty. I was a fisherman <laughs> at night. That really sucked. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, I unloaded cement bags out of, uh, 
rail cars and potato bags out of rail cars. I didn't like that either. Yeah. You know, those were things that I knew that I never wanted to go back to do. And then I went to work in a cannery. I think it was about 18 or 19. It was a seasonal job. And I looked around and I looked at these guys that were 55 that were ready to retire. Their bodies were broken. They were broke. They weren't any, and here I am, 18, 19 years old. My body's good. I'm broke. I said, fuck it. I'm going to retire now and work later. (laughs) And and so I just designed it around what I wanted to do. You know, a lot of people don't want to be with you because there's a lot of $5 weeks. You know, there's a lot of, you know, you, 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 I always believed you have to pay cash. You don't pay time. So there's, you don't borrow. So you don't, you're not indebted to people. Yeah. I always believe that that's a depression mentality that I was brought up with. If you right. can't afford it, don't buy it. Don't buy it. Yeah. You know, and, and um, there's this thing called saving up. Yeah. And I always <laughs> saved. I mean, I saved. My mother said I saved when I was two years old when I got pennies for a birthday or something, you know. And, and But that's my parents came out of depression. My mother's side of the family were farmers. And so they always had that concept was part of it. They only spent what they grew the previous year and sold. My dad's side of the family, they were Polish aristocrats. My dad was the first uh, American born. Mm. They had, you know, like six white horses and carriages and shit. And they got out with a trunk full of whatever. And that was it. And they, everything else they, they gave up. Each side of the family, my grandmother and grandfather, each controlled a canton in Poland. So got a pretty, you know, one arm bleeds blue, the other red. Yeah. <laughs> There's a surfer in the middle. <laughs> and, and that's the other thing. You got to have a, you keep a surfer's mentality. You know, there's a lot of people that surf, but there was only a few of us that lived the life, uh, lived the total life surfing. You know, our, our whole life was evolved around making surfboards, surfing, traveling to go surfing. You know, a, a lot of guys, they were carpenters and they surfed or they were coming from the valley and they surfed or they were school teachers and surfed. But our lives were totally immersed, you know, 100%. Yeah. And I think that had a lot to do with it because you just buy into that program. It's pretty good. Yeah. Now, I also, I got to ask you uh, sort of how you think about, you know, Jack O'Neill now. Jack? I, we were supposed to drink cocktails the night he died. I like Jack was great. I, I, about the last three years, uh, a bunch of us, I'm the youngest by 10 plus years, would go over to his place and drink martinis. And uh, Jack, at this time, we would sit down and talk about different things. He'd ask me about business stuff. I'd ask him about stuff. He was a very smart man. He was a very, um, uh, I knew him when he first came to San, I knew him when he was in Kelly's Cove in San Francisco, because we'd go up and go surfing. And He was uh, selling fire equipment. And I remember when he came down and had his first shop and his first uh, factory over Peacock Road or something over by the drive in Peabody or Peacock Road. And then <clears throat> he built the place over here on 41st. And, and I, I remember the back. He, you know, looking back at it is at the time he was, he was older than me. He was 94 when he died. I was 75. And um, I always thought that, you know, he was, had too much or he was using people and stuff. But then being in that same situation, I knew how I found out how hard it was to do what he was doing or doing what I was doing is nobody gives you money. You know, what's your business plan? Eat, you yeah. know, and he had the same deal and he had six kids and a, and a wife and um, he just did a lot of things and he was a really good self marketer. And I learned a lot of self marketing shit from him, you know, just, I didn't do a lot of it because I wasn't that, out as he was i wasn't i didn't want to have my face on the on the papers and stuff like he did but he's a good guy i he had a good life probably outlived himself by about 10 years his body was pretty much uh broken up before but i remember oh nine months ago or so i'm over at his house and he's got this really comfortable chair and he's got a pair of binoculars that you can shake and they still have focus in you know and I'm looking out at the waves and he says, you can't believe how many waves I catch every day. And I went right on Jack. <laughs> so he's sitting there surfing in his mind. You know, he didn't give it up. He, he always kept surfing. Yeah. In his yeah. mind, he sat there and look at the waves and this is what I'm going to do on this wave. And, um, he was, you know, it was, a, I, I'm glad I got to finish his life off the way I did because it was, it was good for me and I hopefully it was good for him. I, I don't know if this is a weird thing to say, but it's it's cool that you were 
planning to be with him the night he passed. I well, know it's something very cool. Me. There was well, no, I'm five sure. of us. There was, you know, but, Austin Comstock, Dave McGuire, Betty Van Dyke, Lloyd Kahn, and this guy, Dave Sweet. And we'd always kind of try to get over there on a Thursday night to see him, you know. And the previous week, we tried to get over there, and they said he wasn't feeling well. And then we called up again, and it's, yeah, he wasn't feeling well. Eventually, he died that night. But um, it was just something that – and it's good to listen to these guys because there's a lot of things that came out of these meetings that yeah um, you kind of heard rumors about it, you know, especially because they were older than me. And then, you know, a lot of stuff in the Korean War and World War II and stuff that came out that you would go, holy shit, this guy really got a fucked up deal. And you'd heard stories about things, but you'd never really heard from the mountain, from the person that lived it. And finally they come out and they, they tell you it and you just go, you just shake your head. People now could never live through that shit. You know, they'd be in funny farms and, and these guys just yeah. held it all in for all these years. Yeah. But you know, it, I mean, Jack, Jack had the same things and it was more of a, everybody come, it was no uh, holds barred. Everybody would, come out with something you know and i'm sitting here i'm the youngest guy there in the room <laughs> it's like i'm 75 and i'm the youngest guy yeah. you can't believe that one the story's coming out of that piece. yeah um so uh, jack had me almost 20 years so yeah yeah he was a lot older maybe he was a bad influence <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i didn't know him of course but he seemed like a man who in the end um lived an incredible life and and lived a life knowing the contributions and the legacy that he was leaving i i would say jack lived his life and everything the everything that came after or about him i i don't know if he would have bought into a lot of it or i know that when he did his book he had me come over and proofread some stuff and he was kind of like oh this is all bullshit man you know and then paddle outs i don't want to paddle out i don't like paddle outs you know and, um in a sense, he was a very humble person in that he did all this stuff and got all this exposure. But sometimes you think maybe that's not really, he didn't really care. You know, it, it, it provided a service at the time. You never know because he's gone. You know, you just kind of pick up what you think. It's just my opinion. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's, you know, Pat's running the company now. And I think he's stoked that that, that got put in place before he left. And Yeah. And I mean, he had to feel great about, being the creator of the wetsuit well yeah i mean there was there's no? a lot of, um i i don't know if i ever want i want to get into this one. okay but, um, i mean he he created a farmer john wetsuit for surfing um before he got wetsuits you used to get wetsuits from phantom wetsuits in palo alto and you used to get them from sears catalog they were diving suits that's, right. where, that's where the beaver tail came in right and Jack came up with the Farmer John. It was one of his first wetsuits. And Is that what he called it? Yeah, it was a sleeveless, short, sle short legged. Oh wetsuit. yeah, fair enough. And um, Dive and Surf was selling uh, wetsuits at the same time. And I don't know if you call them surfing suits or. Yeah. But I think what Jack did is Jack took a wetsuit called the Farmer John and he made it the surf shoot, the surf shoot, surf suit. Yeah. And I think that he marketed it that way and he marketed that he was a guy that did this. And I think it was an honest marketing deal. And if you lived through that era, you grabbed anything you could and used it to do the sport you wanted to do. So, you know, you give it to him. He, he did do it. You give it, he owns yeah. that. He owns that one, you know? Um, again, this is just my opinions of it. You know, it's just, uh, he was the largest, he he was the largest kind he did the best job of marketing wetsuits for surfing and he pretty much put them on the planet yeah and i think the sad part about it is as you talk about surfboards and the price of surfboards is that when these large companies came in like quicksilver and billabong is they used wetsuits as a loss leader which pushes guys like jack off the hill right you know jack has to sell a suit for 400 dollars, and those guys get to sell suits for 150 the same suit and I don't know where that's going to end up. Hmm. You know, I mean, you got all these guys that call themselves surfers because they took a class and some guy gave them a diploma saying you're a surfer. Then they go to Costco <laughs> and buy a Costco board. Oh, Are they going to go to Costco and buy a Costco wetsuit? And that's 40% yeah. of the market. There doesn't seem to be any appreciation. I don't know. It's, just, it's a weird subject. I, it's kind of out of my, you know, I only look at it. I only can deal with it as an observer. I, 
you know, Jack was a good friend. I mean, we had a good time and I was really fortunate to be able to be with him that much before, before the end. And that's about, he owns everything he did. So. Yeah. Well, I sure, I sure hope he was happy because I think every surfer in the world who uh, surfs in cold water, uh, you know, owes him a debt. Yeah. And I think that they, you know, people, People just show that. I mean, I I was I really wasn't going to go out on the paddle out because it's and a lot of his close friends didn't bother with it. But Pat called me up and said, you know, why don't you go out on the catamaran? We're going to go out on the on Celine Maria. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll do that. You know, we got out there on the catamaran and it was pretty cool. And I'm kind of standing there and some guys playing Beach Boy music. And I said, dude, I go knock this shit off. He said, nobody wants to listen to this crap. What am I going to do? And I say, play Hawaiian music or classical, anything but fucking Beach Boys and Dick Dale. That wasn't anything to do with surfing, you know? And uh, <laughs> so he shuts it off. He's all paranoid that I'm going to kill him or something. But, you know, he puts on some Hawaiian music and I'm sitting there with this guy named Don Hansen, who we go back into the late fifties with and early sixties. And he's got Hansen surfboards and we're talking and we're going, wow, I wonder if anybody's going to show up. We're sitting out here. We couldn't see anything because of the fog. And then the radio was on our boat. The, the, the communication center was on the catamaran. And we hear this thing, oh, would you give us permission to do a flyover? It was the Coast Guard. And so this, it was the Coast Guard's idea? Yeah, to do a flyover. It wasn't you guys? It wasn't. The, the family? Coast, no, I think it was. The Coast just, Guard wanted to do yeah. it. Holy shit. Yeah, it's because he supplied those guys with wetsuits. No, I get it, but yeah. like still. But the we hear it coming. It was a low profile. It was a low chopper. He's like, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. and Don and I are going, holy shit, man! And this guy comes over like this, and then we're how, still, how how above, how high above the water do you think they were? Oh, they were four or five hundred feet. I know there was a drone above them because the guy that had the drone was panicked. The chopper was going to take the drone out. Oh wow! I hadn't heard he that because I was in the water. I remember. Yeah. It. and I I thought, holy shit, they're close. Well, the the chopper goes by and it's really foggy and Don and I are wondering if anybody's going to come out and the fog would still, the cliff, you, there was really nobody. There was a few people paddling out, but not a lot. And as the chopper goes by his house, it's kind of like the fog just lifts up and it was like ants coming down the hill. I go, Don, look, check this out. And he goes, turn around. And I look down towards Capitola and they're like massive coming. I go, Don, look down here at 20. We just saw these people massing in from everywhere. And we were just like, holy cow. This is unbelievable. I think it's probably the biggest paddle out ever. That's what my understanding is. Yeah. yeah. Now it's a lot of, the funny part was is this guy, Terry Campion, TC owns the board boardroom. He brought his boat out and he parked it about 50 yards from us. And just as he's throwing a surfboard in the water, a 20 foot white shark breached. You gotta be kidding. No. And you guys were all sitting in the water. So <laughs> close to us. Yeah. I said, wow. Terry, don't say anything. There's a bunch of people on, pop outs down below Costco Holy boards and I said, don't shit. say anything but get in the middle of all these guys and they'll eat them first and don't don't tell my <laughs> wife about this no it was right outside and there there's a lot of sharks out there right now yeah and there's only one entry into the kelp bed though that's over by uh, sewer peak they can't get in any other way yeah because they don't want they're not going straight into the kelp they can't there's it's the only channel that's there that's deep enough for them to get in especially the big ones you might be able to get a smaller one in but there's that's the only channel to get in is near sewers yeah right by sewers you'll see there's kind of like a hole in the kelp there and there's a trench on there. the point side or on the rock on the uh, right about between rockview and uh first peak just about where sewer okay. peak breaks there's a you, you'll see it it's it's a cutout and the only reason we know it is that in the 60s, we were watching this fishing boat put around and we saw this uh, fin that was, looked like it was big as a fishing boat. And it actually came in that channel. Wow. So anyway, that didn't get eaten. <laughs> as far as I know, no one got eaten that day. No, but it was pretty cool. that the, the white breach and Jack's paddle out. Wow. Very cool. But yeah, he, he had a good go down. He, he did a good job. It was really moving to be in the water. Yeah, I mean, I got real moved. Uh, Don and I, Don, I mean, I go, I knew Jack before Don did. Don knew Jack from the fifth, late 50s on. He came in shape for him. Um, and we had a lot of good O'Neill stories. And then there was a couple, Betty Van Dyke and Erlene Colfer, uh, Erlene Myers. They were the couple of the only girls surfers at the time. And they both knew Jack really well. 
and he took care of all those people. I mean, you know, you, you need a wetsuit, you know, Jack would take care of you. Yeah. And so he just, it was pretty cool. You know, it's, uh, I'm glad I got to do it. Yeah. And thank, thankfully to Tim and Pat O'Neill. They're the ones that talked me into it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you went out with them. That's <laughs> yeah. very cool. Yeah. It was fun. Now, as you think forward, um, you know, what do you think about the future? What are your thoughts about the future of the business, your life, I both? I just keep plunking along. I, it looks good. I'm kind of really, uh, I, I'm kind of worried right now of the position that America is in the world because in dealing with 80 countries, there's a lot of doubt with who we are right now. And hmm. we seem to be giving a lot away, you know, we're like giving our number one position in the world away to, it looks like China's going to take it. And it's, you know, it's, you know, when you have 40% of the world's GDP in your hand and you walk away from it and then you negotiate with China and North Korea, you're not a good negotiator. You want to go, you want to negotiate with some power. Hmm. You know, and, and walking away from Europe, you know, you're leaving Merkel and Macron in charge over there. So that all affects business of what I do. You know, I mean, those are. You feel those things. Yeah. And I, my, my distributors and my licensees feel them. You know, that's the main subject is where is this guy going? You know, it's like, how can you fuck up America? You know, let's, let's break up NAFTA. You know, I mean, that's $17.8 billion of Kansas and Missouri farming going away. New Mexico, from my understanding, I had some Argentinians up here, and Mexico has already signed contracts for corn and wheat and stuff out of Argentina in anticipation of this move. Well, that doesn't do our farmers any good. You know, and then you have your farmers in the San Joaquin Valley furling their crops because they can't get pickers. You have, you know, Brussels sprout pickers or strawberry pickers on one side and artichoke pickers on the other, and one guy's going over and offering the workers more to get them to change hats and go to the other side. That's not good. You know, that's not, I mean, I, I sell shit. And if people don't have money to buy shit, I can't sell shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm old. It doesn't really matter what happens because I'm not going to live here to see it. But, I mean, the last eight years for me have been my best business years ever. You know? Wow. Right after the crash Incredible. in 2009, I had yeah. to make an adjustment. But after that, it's been steady growth. It's been really good international relationships a lot more respect from the previous administration coming in. So meaning a lot more business for me and the second one. And we're just, I mean, real stable business. And I don't know what this guy's got. I don't know what he's doing. And I think that's a lot to, and I don't think he's a very smart person. I don't think he reads very well. And he's surrounding himself with a lot of crooks too. So it's the instability you feel in the business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what, I, that's my feeling and my opinion. I'm from California. You know, I'm from one of the highest tax states in the in the country, but we're also the sixth largest economy. Um, so, you know, I mean, if you're in the if you're in the technology business, I'd really be sweating it. If you're in the auto business, I would be shitting bricks right now because if he fucks with NAFTA, he's going to destroy the auto industry. Um, so I don't know. You know, I mean, I'm okay personally. Yeah. You know, I'm taken care of. I worked it out for myself. Yeah. But I've got... We don't have to pass the plate for Rich. <laughs> yeah. And I got, I got 18 and 19-year-old kids coming up, uh, nephews and stuff coming up. Sure. To, like, what's going to happen with them? I mean, is he going to, you know, what are you going to do, bomb North Korea? You know, you're going to run away from a treaty that... I sure uh, hope not. Yeah. I mean, look at the Iran thing. You know, you're running away from a treaty and all the other nations are walking away from you on it. And it means that America has no respect in the world if you break a treaty no respect in the world. You can't trust them. It goes, and it goes all the way back to the Indians when they broke those treaties. You know, I, I don't know what your politics are, but that scares me. Yeah. Ooh, I, I think I'm like a lot of people. I'm a, uh, I believe in entrepreneurship. I believe in, um, uh, I, I believe in providing incentive for people to go out in the world and create things. So, you know, I'm uh, on the economic side uh, and on some things on the social side, I'm, I'm more libertarian. Um, but on the, uh, on the, on the uh, same token, I, I want to live in a world where we take care of each other when bad shit happens. Yeah. It's, you know, generally beyond our control when somebody gets hurt or sick. I think, I think we collectively need to take care of them and figure out how to do that. Um, 
you know, I come from a country with a social safety net and I'm not a big fan of handouts, but at the same time, um, you know, we got a lot of people who should be in hospitals that are on the streets. So, you know, the thing I actually care the most about on all this stuff is that we can't have a discussion as a nation. We can't on healthcare. We immediately go to our, you know, places. We can't say, Hey, when someone gets sick or hurt in our world, what do we want to have happen? Let's just have that discussion. Then let's talk about how it gets paid for. Yeah. Right. But let's start with what do we want to have fucking happen? And do we want there to be a huge economic capability that says if you're rich, good things happen. And if you're poor, you're fucked. Is that, are we okay with that? Didn't that doesn't that lead to, lead to revolution? Well, <laughs> I think probably, but I don't think it's right. I don't either. I agree. I'm a fiscal conservative. I believe in exactly this, pretty much the same. And I believe that everybody should have a shot at entrepreneurism if they want it. And I give talk sometimes on entrepreneurism and my idea of being an entrepreneur is thinking of a product or project creating the project and then having my skin in it and and I talk to kids now that are young and their idea is coming up with a plan finding somebody else's money to use to become an entrepreneur and so you really don't have a lot of skin in the game you know it's going okay well this is a little different way of doing things <laughs> but I, you know we have no control of what goes on in the world and you know you take care of people that are close to you, you take care of your investments and your you know you invest in things and i mean i just got my clock clean trying to donate a skate park to capitola i a, a friend of mine told me this story it, it, it's sort of when i when i heard it rich i thought no good deed goes unpunished, was right? Just, it was out there. We have, now you have some big-ass legal bill, is that right? Oh, yeah. The guy comes up and uh, he threw a Hail Mary and won. And sitting as a layman in court, you, I would say there was collusion between the judge and the lawyer. Uh, probably is not the case at all, but sitting as a they layman. They sued you for wanting to give the town we, a skate we, park, we decided, right? We were going to donate um, a skate park. We had a the best skate park builders in the world. We had the Tony Hawk foundation. We had all of the, all the players in place. We had a piece of property. It started out as a 9,000 square foot park. It's sandwiched between a middle school, a soccer field and a baseball diamond across the street from two churches. And about nine people uh, that live across the street got into this battle. So we made 23 concessions to them, dropped the thing down to 6,000 square feet, we had a 5-0 vote going all the way through the city council, all the way through everything. So the intent of the city was to build this park. So they brought this lawyer in, and he's a CEQA lawyer, which he specializes in this stuff. He walked away from CEQA and uh, got a, a technicality on us, which was missing use between a word resolution and motion. And he won on that basis, and he pretty much shut us down. And so then... For the misuse of a word? Well, it, yeah, we had to, two people had to recuse themselves as a city council. And so he's saying that we needed to have a 3-0 vote and we had a 2-1 vote. So if you look at it and you can go to court and you can run it down to the, the other end, you can say, well, how does any city in the state of California function? Because there's always some sort of recusal in city meetings. And so the city had to correct that. And the judge said, if you can correct this thing. And so in the interim, they had a change of, uh, council people. And the one council person that got voted in before the election, we said, are you, what is, what is your vote going to be? And she said, well, I've never, I would never overturn a previous council's decision. And then she came out and overturned it. She voted against it. And I think it was more that she didn't like me than it was, um, the deal. So now we're stuck with a huge legal bill. But I, I look at this and I go, so wait a minute, we, we live in a world where we all, know that kids spend way too much time we all spend way too much time on our devices and many of us spend too much time indoors etc etc so you're going to create a skate park it's going to have kids outside Mm -hmm. doing a physical athletic in a city park not not in private property in the middle of a community park and the city and the cost of the city is zero Zero. yeah because rich shows up and says hey as the sort of as the skateboard guy i want to give my hometown this beautiful park yeah. And so I get shit on. <laughs> is there any chance it happens or is it finished? It's done. I'm done with it. Yeah. You know, it was really a 
good lesson to not get involved with anything like that again. Any community, any anything to do with politics or councils or anything, just fuck it. They can go find their own money. Yeah, I'm not gonna not ever do that again. That's it's just like my niece and my niece-in-law carried. They've been working on it since 2011, and I mean, city support was great. Everything was great, and then they call themselves friends of Monterey Park. Fomp. We call them fucking old miserable people. <laughs> And they are. They're just a miserable lot of people that that um, either don't like kids and, you know, maybe they do have a case. I mean, it was 300, 200 feet from their house. Uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, the skate parks aren't that noisy. This was an inter, big inter to intermediate park, so it wasn't a full bore park, you know, and yeah, they don't want it. They don't want it. They don't get it. So I'm just going to get myself yeah. out of the trouble that and, I'm and in and do that again. go on my way and... Uh, I'll make, you know, these, I was reading an article. There are other ways you can make contributions, right? I just help people like I've been doing all along, you know, yeah. help some old lady that needs to make a living or something. Screw these people. They're, uh, the politicians are just out there. You know, uh, they lie, they cheat, they do all this shit, and then you're supposed to still like them. I don't. I don't like them. And I, and I have no problem saying that I don't like them. And I'll sit here and name names and point fingers all day long, but I'm not going to do it today. Yeah, no, um, fair enough. Uh, but so that's done. That's, that's enough of my philanthropy career. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I might turn around in a couple of weeks and trying to turn chicken shit into chicken soup somehow, but it's, there's nothing coming out. I of got a lot of chicken shit right out here. If you need I can that, give I you can a, be a yeah. supplier. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got to I got I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I just really feel bad to, for the kids of Capitola. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and then in the exposure of the, the fee, the fee deal, there was a couple names on the thing that really blew me away. I mean, and I, I've got them in my targets. I'll someday along the line, they'll something will come along and I'll don't fuck them. with an old pirate, right? Yeah. Rich? yeah, don't get mad, get even. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anything else you want to touch on before we kick out of this wave? I think we kick out and I'll do another one with you sometime. We'll get into the details. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of fun. I would love to. Um, yeah, I'll bring Hout with me next time. That would be. A dream come true to have both of you. Yeah. Might have to make you buy him an, buy another board from him. It's, uh, That's okay. I need another board. Uh, he just had arm surgery last week. Ten days. He came by today to show me that he was alive. How's he doing? Uh, he had a shitty time. Yeah, he's, he's coming out of it though. He looks really good today. Good. Um, Man, do we ever need Doug Howe? He uh, changed my surfing. He's he's a he's my best friend. Yeah, you know, he's he's a good guy and. Uh, I got to get a couple more, a couple more boards. I'm trying to get this one balsa board out of him, but he's keeping it for his daughter and he even tried to make a deal with his daughter and she shut me down. So <laughs> can you get him to make another one? No, nah, I don't know. No. Man. This thing is just so pristine that, uh, I don't know why somebody, I mean, he had it for sale for a while and nobody bought it. And I don't know why. Yater had one, a balsa board down in Santa Barbara in the shop. And some guy came by and bought it for two grand. I mean, that's a $20,000 board. Fuck. He just did. He got him at a low point where he wanted to get rid of it. Wow. So, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Doug will, I got a lot of Doug shit. I, <laughs> I, I, want, I want Doug healthy and alive. I don't care about the rest of it. Yeah. Well, I got a lot more bucket list to do with him. And he's my, my surfboard and my fly fisherman guy. So yeah, I got to keep my poles in shape, my flies tied and my surfboards on hand. You guys have a lot more pirating to do, don't you? <laughs> Something we're trying to figure out. We, we start looking at, we think we can still, uh, the last time I went to Maldives, I got into some outer reef stuff and I did it. And then I, as I'm looking at a bare reef at a double overhead wave, I'm going, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> I've already done this shit. I don't, I need the, the hero wave, the head high, uh, stand bottom, uh, up and down, look, make me look like a hero. That's you know? my wave right there. <laughs> yeah. And I just like, Oh, here I am out here challenging, charging these things with these kids because I don't know why I'm stupid. You know? <laughs> but I, I, you know, Doug and I always think about this and, and, and then we kind of go, wow, you know, we're just having a hard time getting to our feet fast enough to make it work. Yeah. You know, it's a, and Doug gets, he's a, you get him to his feet and he's a fucking unbelievable surfer, but getting up right now has really been, a, I've got a titanium rod in my leg and half of it's numb. So that's my problem, my front leg. So, and we talk about it a lot, but there's some waves in them. 
yeah. see if we can get him going. His shoulder's really bad. So I hope he gets that thing back together. Then we'll be back in business. Do you think he'll surf this season? We're shooting for spring. Okay. As I say, we. Yeah. You know, it's like, right. All right, Doug, we're going surfing. He's your husband. <laughs> yeah. yeah he's, he's we're going brother. surfing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's set up for him. You know, I, the funny part about surfing is, is you start out and you surf places like 38th Avenue and Cal's beach, you know, and then as you grow along with it, you're surfing YMA on sunset and uh, you know, all over the world, you're surfing these big freaking gnarly waves. And then as you get older, you all, you circled all the way back around to Cal's beach and 38th Avenue. And you think <laughs> you're on the big waves again. It's really funny. We were talking about the other day. It's like, wow, we've circled, you know, in our heads, we're still over here, but in reality, we're back here. Yeah. Well, I guess per your uh, story about Jack, even when you're on the bluff looking, and yeah, we're surfing. Surf. Yeah, I mean, this last swell, I'm looking at these guys, and I'm, you know, there's 40, 50 guys out, and I'm going, wow, there's two guys that are actually know which wave to take up on. Yeah. And the rest of these guys have no clue. And the problem is, is the guys that knew what they were doing as they got close more to the inside to where everybody else was sitting, they got dangerous. Right. So you really can't milk the wave because there's a lot of good inside shit. Yeah. You know, so we'll see. Well, Rich, I can't thank you enough. This yeah, has this been is good. absolutely outstanding. Not as threatening as you. We haven't even hit Verve yet. No, we got a lot to talk about there. <laughs> we got a lot to talk about yeah, there. Those guys are pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, I think they think you're pretty cool too. So I hope so. I, I mean, you've they, done a tremendous amount, you know. Yeah. They, you can't get to where they are without help. And uh, yeah, yeah. They've, they've been really lucky. Um, they've got a guy named uh, Mike Glick involved in it. He's been really good with them. Yeah. Uh, so the guy, Dave Henning, he was the one that started up with them. Yeah. And he's, he's literally saved their ass in the beginning and got them going. And then I came in and picked up some pieces and then Mike Glick came in and Mike has a company called LA specialties. They control, they sell all the food to the top end restaurants from Mexico to Oregon and a 48 hour inventory turnaround, man. Can you believe wow. that? One? What a crazy. Yeah. I'd like to, I told him that it's unbelievable. And the food that he drops off at these restaurants, there can't be any waste because the chef is just going to open it up and use it. So everything has to be handpicked. Wow. He, what a precision. Yeah. He's is. just an old hippie that started this thing, but <laughs> it, it really helps Verve out. And it really gives them stability and it gives them some people with their, where their feet are on the ground and they're not yeah. living in an illusion. You know, it's, when I was young, I laid on the beach for about 10 years waiting for the millionaire to come by and give me a million dollars. It never happened. You know, right. I just hope that Col uh, Colby and Ryan can like not worry about that and go forward. They seem to be executing. I mean, uh, everything good. I know. Yeah. They're, uh, you know, Colby's a good front man for it and Ryan's a good, uh, backdoor guy for it, you know? So, yeah. And I mean, Mike seems to be doing a great job as a CEO. Mike is, uh, you know, I teamed up with Mike when I first went in there because he was the, he's the guy that's holding that thing together. Yeah. He's, uh, you know, really, I'll just tell you one quick funny story and we'll leave. So when I was young, I always read about Howard Hughes, you know, Howard Hughes, Hughes, Hughes machinery, you know, Hopalong Cassidy was his babysitter and, you know, all these classic tales. Well, his dad dies and he inherits his company and then he goes off on this life of just entrepreneurism, just whatever, you know, stars in bedrooms and shit. And so I always wondered, I read everything I could and I tried to figure out what held him together. Why was he so successful? Well, the secret was is he had a Mormon accountant. So I'm sitting, <laughs> I'm sitting there one day talking to Mike Iyer, and I'm telling him this story, and Mike goes, uh, I'm a Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> so all that reading got me somewhere. That's so funny. Uh, well, he's so tolerant of my bad behavior. Yeah. Yeah, so he's, Mike's, a good, Mike's a really good guy. He's really yeah, smart. That's and and uh, yeah. I think he's probably the backbone right right now he's the guy that's keeping it together yeah because he's awesome. a day-to-day -day guy yeah and the cool thing is the three of them have created a you know a real partnership where often yeah. that doesn't work as you well know i know it's hard to have partners and uh I, and it's there, there's times that are really trying and there's decisions that should be made a little bit faster and, sure um, but it's going where it should be going yeah it's going to be killing good. it yeah uh, we'll see we'll get, next year we'll talk about this there's again some, some big new products coming so 
I hope so. Yeah, fingers you know crossed. what they are. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> you snuck in. I have. I've snuck in, and I, I'm very excited. So I am too. All righty. So, more to talk about next time. Yeah, yeah. I'll see if I can drag Howard in here. That would be we'll great. Surf stories. Two le- two legends for the price of one. <laughs> yeah, you get a double story. Then he doesn't remember a lot on purpose. <laughs> he says I don't remember. He asked me something today. Where did we eat when we were in El Salvador and Guatemala? And I said, we had El Gachos because there was no protein. So we had to go up every week and get some protein. He said, I don't remember that. I don't remember us eating at restaurants. And I said, well, whatever. Said, How do you remember that? And I said, because I love the meat. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I like the food. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll get him in here and talk to him. I'll get him rolling. Excellent. Well, Rich, it has been an honor. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Cool. Wow, 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 wow. That was a magical mystery tour. Thank you so much, Rich. If you love this episode as much as I did, why not share it on social media right now? Now, before we wrap the show, I uh, uh, also want to let you know we have a new uh, mini book coming out called Niche Down. It's for uh, individuals in their careers. It's for uh, solopreneurs, youpreneurs, and for small business, small e-entrepreneurs. And it's about how category design can apply to you in uh, picking a niche. And as my friend Scott Lowry, uh, uh, entrepreneur Scott Lowry, founder or, or uh, head of Fathom in, um, in the Midwest, fathomdelivers.com, check them out. <laughs> Scott Lowry says, uh, how, uh, category design is about how to uh, pick your niche and get nouveau riche. And so niche down is really about how category design applies to your career for solopreneurs and for small businesses. If you would like a preview teaser of uh, our new mini book, Niche Down, which by the way, I need to tell you is being co-authored uh, by my dear longtime friend, the incredible, the amazing Heather Clancy. If you haven't checked her episode of Legends and Losers out, please do that. And you'll be hearing more from Heather on Legends and Losers soon. And uh, I couldn't be more excited than, uh, than to be writing this with Heather. So if you would like a, a free teaser, think of it as a white paper, advance of um, Niche Down, here's what we'd ask you to do. Write a review of Legends and Losers, cut and paste that review into an email, send that email to blackhole at legendsandlosers.com, and we will send you a free copy of the teaser for our book, uh, Niche Down. Now, before we wrap the show, uh, it's been a while since we did some shout outs. So uh, I want to say a, a big hello and thank you to our good friend, Dwayne France, for his legendary Stitcher and iTunes review. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Uh, Jonathan Meyer, for your awesome, legendary iTunes review. Thank you so much. Uh, Quincy Reed. Quincy, thank you so much for your incredible, heartfelt um, comments about episode 62 with sitting, fe- uh, sitting uh, court... Uh, Geez, Locke had learned how to talk with sitting judge Kelvin Filer, episode 62. If you haven't heard Judge Filer on Legends and Losers, um, I know this sounds like hyperbole, but it will change the way you think. Check out episode 62. Quincy Reed, thank you so much for that amazing uh, LinkedIn shout out. Holly Hester Riley, thank you so much for your enthusiastic, uh, uh, as you might say in the parlance of our times, Twitter love. Ryan Alter, uh, been a longtime friend of the show. Uh, thanks so much, Ryan, for your amazing uh, iTunes review. Patrick Jasurowski, Jess, oh, geez, I'm going to screw up your last name, Patrick. J A S Z E W S K I. So, excuse my dyslexic brain, but Patrick, love your Stitcher review. Nathan Hayes, your iTunes review. Thank you so much. Uh, Nick Brault in uh, beautiful Montreal, Canada. Bonjour, Nick. Nick, uh, ça va bien. I want to thank you so much for connecting with me on LinkedIn, for sharing uh, uh, some of your life with me, and um, uh, you know, glad to know you're with us on Legends and Losers. And to Mick Pano, Mick, you're awesome. Uh, he's been posting on LinkedIn about Play Bigger. He was posting on LinkedIn about the amazing episode with Charles Watchner, um, uh, the incredible. Uh, executive producer from Hollywood on content. If you haven't checked out the Charles episode, I encourage you to do that. Mick, thank you so much for your amazing uh, shout outs. All right. We would like to thank NHS Incorporated, the home of the world's leading surf and skate brands. Check them out at nhsfunfactory.com. HarperCollins Instant Classic Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators create and dominate markets. Why not pick up a couple hundred copies wherever you buy legendary books today? Our good friends at Equity Directory, 
If you're in the startup ecosystem, you got to get with the program and get to equitydirectory.co, the invite only network of entrepreneurs and startup talent exchanging work for equity. Our good friends, Tim Rode, Brian Rocha, and the entire team at onelifefullylived.org. Dream, plan, and live your best life. We're a nonprofit. Check us out. We want to make a difference for you and the people in your life. Speaking of making a difference, our good friends at NetSuite, number one in cloud ERP. If you run a growing entrepreneurial business, uh, we'd love it if you checked out netsuite.com, the platform for growth. Uh, for small entrepreneurs, and we have some big news coming up with NetSuite soon. Our friends at Kiva.org, a wonderful nonprofit, a legendary micro loans that change lives. If you want to make a difference for small e entrepreneurs around the world, check out Kiva.org and the power of microfinance. John Vroman's uh, amazing new book, The Front Row Factor. He's also got a podcast of the same name. He's one of our favorite people. I've been on the show. I love the book. John's been on our show. Check it out, Front Row Factor. Speaking of podcasts we love, our friend and guest, Matty A., the Millionaire Mindcast. This is a young entrepreneur who could have gone the wrong way and instead is doing some legendary shit. Check out Millionaire Mindcast Podcast. And in Santa Cruz, check out Mike Block, Realtor. If you want to make your Santa Cruz dreams come true, Mike's your guy. If you want to move to Santa Cruz, check out Mike, B-L-O-C-H, Com. And of course, Verve Coffee, the official coffee of legends and losers in Santa Cruz, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Tokyo, and always at vervecoffee.com. Yes, Beatrice. And we would like to remind you that today's podcast is an oddcast solely for your odd informational purposes. Uh, clearly, this oddcast is produced in a studio that does contain, 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 contain Canadian nuts. <laughs> Uh, and it is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared the shit out of it. We got to remind you to teach water sports, learn to surf, never mistreat your mother. Don't forget Legends and Losers is on uh, YouTube. Uh, go ahead, buy a, a skateboard. It's okay to pee in your wetsuit. Remember, we hated United Airlines long before it was cool. Uh, Santa Cruz, California, come check us out. It's beautiful. And uh, Wackadoo never takes a day off here. Thank you, Dandy Candy. We love you. Mom and Dad, boy, do we ever love you too. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Bill McDermott, Chief Executive Officer of SAP. Sorry, Billy, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. We look forward to seeing you again soon on another episode of Legends and Losers. <laughs>